Yeah. For as long as you like. Germany, this man. Good evening, everybody. The 18th meeting of the 25th Council will come to order. Um, all counselors are present this evening with Councillor Bassan attending via Zoom. We'll start with a moment of silence with the Pledge of Allegiance in English by Vice President Lewis and in Spanish by Councillor Peña. Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from the council staff at the table near the chamber's entrance. Uh, we do have uh, the ability for everyone to view this meeting in person, but also on live streams through four different platforms, GovTV, which is on Comcast Channel 16, the GovTV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. The live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, the tablets, and computers. Also, this meeting is closed captions, and you may enable your closed captioning at this time if you like. The video recording of this and past meetings will remain available for viewing at any time on the website of the City Council, and Council staff is available to help you if you need help with viewing uh, those past meetings by just calling during working hours Monday through Friday, 768-3100. Uh, the council will take a break at approximately 7 this evening if needed. And with regard to decorum in the chambers, we want tonight's proceeding to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not make personal attacks and please no applause or other outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we're respectful of one another. And I know, hey, I understand, you know, being behind your cause and all that. But, but if we ha allow applause after every speaker or after any statement or whatever, um, it's really gonna drag out the meeting for everybody and that's just not fair. So we're asking you to please comply with that. And uh, we'll move on, let's see. Uh, if there is a problem with anything like that, one warning will be provided. Uh, and on continued disruption, the individual will be asked to leave. Uh, proclamations and presentations. We have a couple of presentations tonight, uh, and starting with one on affordable home ownership to combat climate change, presented by Johanna Gilligan, uh, Senior Director of Community Development of HomeWise, and Kelly O'Donnell, PhD, Home Wisdom Director of HomeWise. Uh, come on. Good morning, Mr. President, uh, members of the council. My name again is Kelly O'Donnell. Good to see you. Um, and I, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with my colleague, Johanna Gilligan. We are both with HomeWise. I um, am an economist who, and a recovering bureaucrat and a recovering academician. And I've uh, held many different roles in and around government in New Mexico over the last 25 years. Uh, most recently, I joined HomeWise uh, about a year ago. And we ha at HomeWise have been looking at comprehensive strategies for um, increasing the supply and access to affordable housing. And in the context of those conversations, uh, we started thinking about the role that housing, and most specifically the proximity of housing to work and school and jobs, um, uh, the role that that plays in contributing to climate change. And we did some, we've done some interesting research in Santa Fe and we have adapted that research uh, to, to the Albuquerque situation, which is markedly different from that of Santa Fe. Um, can you go ahead and uh, put up the first slide? Is the first slide up? 
It is? Oh, there it is. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> okay. So next slide, please. I think that covers that one. So the objective of today's presentation is four-part. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the role of home ownership in the affordable housing continuum, because owning a home is often not thought of as affordable home ownership or affordable housing, but in fact it is. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the role that residential real estate development plays in contributing to climate change and can play in helping us to combat climate change. Um, we want to talk a little bit about um, how the planning and zoning processes uh, make uh, siting affordable housing difficult, and particularly siting housing that is climate responsive, and uh, the impediments that planning and zoning also uh, create for responsive, climate responsible development. And finally, last but not least, we want to advocate for climate responsive development, real, residential real estate development in Albuquerque. Next slide, please. So, home, home ownership is often not considered part of the affordable housing spectrum. Generally, people think of, uh, when they think about affordable housing, they think about rentals. However, in fact, home ownership is a very, very important part of the affordable housing spectrum. Um, number one, uh, most significantly, home ownership is often more affordable than renting. Um, rents increase much faster than the costs of owning for a typical homeowner. Um, because they increase with inflation, whereas um, the costs associated with home ownership are often pretty close to fixed. Um, and home ownership provides a sustainable solution to the affordable housing problem in that the housing uh, costs associated with home ownership are relatively fixed for about 30 years if you have a fixed rate mortgage. And when we've looked at average rents and average mortgage payments here in Albuquerque and Santa Fe and elsewhere in New Mexico, what we found is that a lot of people are paying more in rent than they would be paying for uh, an affordable home, uh, and often a much larger home. Um, so why? You know, why is it the case that rentals get so much more attention than home ownership? And there are a few reasons. Number one, home ownership and its role in the affordable housing continuum is poorly understood. We often think of home ownership as a privilege that is reserved for people who have attained a certain degree of economic stability, when in fact, it's not for everyone, but uh, home ownership can be the source of economic stability for a household. Um, the other, the other, a couple other reasons that home ownership is not often considered in this context has to do with how we regard providing assistance to people who can't necessarily afford to purchase a home entirely on their own. Um, although the one-time costs associated with facilitating home ownership, if it, uh, a grant, for instance, of down payment assistance, although those costs are relatively low and one-time and can put a family in a household for 30 years, I need some water. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, can put a family in a house they can afford for 30 years, um, and rentals often cost multiple times more to support a family in a, house, in a rental for 10 years or five years or even three. Um, it is not often considered affordable housing, and that has a lot to do with how we regard assistance to people and the desire that governments and, and communities often have to tightly control how people utilize assistance that's provided to them by the government. So there's a degree of paternalism that, um, are, that, that is sort of uh, inherent to the ignoring of the role of home ownership in the affordable housing spectrum. Um, and of course, home ownership is more than single family homes. You know, there's lots of different ways to own a home. In New Mexico, it's mostly single family homes, but we don't want to ignore townhomes and condos and all the various other ways that people can, in fact, own their own home. Next slide, please. This slide really just shows you a little bit of analysis that we did at HomeWise on, on the, um, the cost burden associated with home ownership. Often we talk about affordability in terms of the percentage of income that is, has to be devoted to housing. And we talk and we say that people who have to spend more than 30% of their income on housing, we call them cost burdened. 
and people who have to spend more than 50% of their income on housing, exceedingly, or not exceedingly, severely cost burdened. I like exceedingly, but. <laughs> Um, and as you can see from these graphs here, what we did is we looked at some representative cities here in New Mexico, Albuquerque, Las Cruces, Santa Fe, um, and we looked at people at different levels of um, income. So we, we tried to control a little bit for income. And what you find is that renters have higher cost burden than owners, regardless of the city they're in, and regardless of their income strata. So we, we know that renting is very expensive, and we have done a quite a bit of analysis that shows that a good, a, a significant percentage of people currently renting here in New Mexico could afford to own if they had down payment approval. So, next slide, please. And this is just a picture of why home ownership makes sense from a financial perspective. This is just essentially, you know, what what uh, that dark purple line is rent. This, this is a 30-year time horizon. Rent is a fairly consistently rises. It rises with inflation. Um, whereas the costs associated with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, they stay relatively flat. I mean, there are obviously some costs that are impacted by inflation taxes and, and, uh, and homeowner costs. But by and large, we're talking about stable housing payments for a 30-year window with a one-time infusion of down payment assistance. And what this, the one thing I failed to mention um, before was another reason home ownership is so important in the affordable housing continuum is because every time a qualified renter household moves into their own home, they free up a, an affordable unit for another rental household. So these are all connected. And the more people you can move into sustainable home ownership, the more affordable rentals you have available to people who need them. Next slide, please. And this is, is just another picture of the same phenomenon. And, and this is essentially, um, this is uh, cost, housing costs as a percentage of income. So as you can see, over 30 years with a fixed rate mortgage, your housing costs as a percentage of your income go down. I think most people here can probably relate to that. Um, I certainly can. Whereas as a renter, uh, even as income grows over time, which is typical, housing costs as a percentage of that income continue to increase. So the, both the long-term and the short-term uh, financial benefits of uh, affordable home ownership are pretty significant. Next slide, please. This pretty picture is really um, just to show you some of the work we're doing at HomeWise. Um, this is a map of the United States that looks at the home ownership gap by race. And so you can use this map, which is on the HomeWise website, to uh, click on your community and look at how the home ownership rate for uh, racial and ethnic minorities differ from that of white non-Hispanic people. And you can look at it by different racial categories, and you can look at it at different geographies. But what it basically shows is that there is a gap. And then in addition to this map, you can generate reports which show for any of the, any of the uh, areas identified how many renters in that area could conceivably afford to own a home um, and how that differs by race. You know, it's, it's an imperfect mechanism, as these things often are, but it's very, very compelling when you look at the gap and, and how much easier it would be to close that gap than we sometimes assume. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. So, Santa Fe is not Albuquerque, um, and, and Albuquerque is not Santa Fe, and we needed to be very clear about that. And the analysis we did for Santa Fe, which really looked at the one third of people who work in Santa Fe who live outside of Santa Fe County and their carbon footprint, that isn't super applicable to Albuquerque because Albuquerque is largely contained here within Bernalillo County and, and a lot of people live fairly close in. They aren't commuting from you know, an hour, two hours away typically to get to work in Albuquerque. But one of the, the thing that, the, and another significant difference between Albuquerque and Santa Fe is that in Santa Fe, is really struggling with a lack of development, a lack of affordable development. Here in, in Albuquerque, there is a lack of development, but th what has happened is that affordable home ownership opportunities are getting further and further afield, such that people who want to own a home have to go to the far west side. People who have moderate income or modest income have to go to the far west side in order to own. And what that means is that they are trading off transportation costs, time with their families, um, 
all of the various downsides to long commutes, they are absorbing that as additional cost. And so what appears to be affordable housing on the west side is, in fact, increasingly unaffordable once you factor in the costs to the people who have to commute, their families, and more importantly, to the overall environment and to the rest of us who are going to be struggling with climate change for many years to come. Um, so ne next slide, sorry. And so this is a, most recently, uh, about two or three weeks ago, we did a webinar on the role of residential real estate development in contributing to climate change. And that uh, webinar, which uh, included Councillor Fubelkorn, is on uh, our website, homewisdom.org. Home Wisdom is the research and policy, newly stood up research and policy component of HomeWise. And next slide, please. So, and this again is, is back to the Albuquerque-Santa Fe distinction. Essentially, the real distinction here is that Albuquerque, though generally more open to development than Santa Fe, has, has sort of, I don't know, I, I, I guess reverted might be the wrong word, but has conceded to sprawl as a way to, um, to develop housing. And that is, you know, that is a choice, maybe a choice made by default, but a choice in, in, in fact. Um, next slide, please. And so the next slide will be presented by Johanna Gilligan. Johanna is the Senior Director for Community Development at HomeWise. Thank you so much, council members. It's very nice to be here. So our community development work at HomeWise is focused on central neighborhoods in both Santa Fe and Albuquerque that have experienced disinvestment. And we believe that responsive community development requires community input. So we've crafted a strategy that provides us with a community direction for our commercial buildings that we're either renovating or building new as part of our broader mixed-use development strategy. And um, we've crafted this approach working in Borellis over the last three years. And I thought I'd share a little bit about that to um, give some color to how, how, where the challenges of this approach have been. So we conducted a neighborhood survey in Borellis in 2020, uh, led by a community advisory board that helped us select the questions uh, and interpret the answers, working with Dr. Gabe Sanchez at UNM and serving 160 households in the neighborhood. We learned in that survey that there was a strong need for job training and early child care in the neighborhood and set out to find tenants who could rent commercial properties that we owned to bring those uses to the neighborhood. We also worked to secure the necessary subsidy to ensure that they could rent from us. A project that exemplifies this responsive approach is the Koala's Children Academy, which is an expansion of a five-star bilingual woman-owned child care facility um, operator to an open to a space that will open 60 new seats in the Borellis neighborhood, including infant seats, which are in very short supply. Another example is our partnership with the Street Food Institute to create the Borellis Central Kitchen, which will foster economic development and inclusive job training by supporting 20 plus food businesses and entrepreneurs for year, per year. So although both of these projects were grounded in data gathered from a large sample of Borellis residents, we were surprised to learn that the Borellis Neighborhood Association opposed our entitlement process on both projects. And I think that this is important to note because we believe that this experience is representative of a more common occurrence, which is that there can be a disconnect between what members of a neighborhood association may be opposing and what broader community residents who may not have as much time or capacity do want. So this points to a larger issue, slowing down the kind of development that will bring affordable housing in places that make the overall cost of living lower, because like Kelly was saying, people have access to work, to life, to school, to social activities. This kind of proximity requires higher density and a stronger commitment to affordable residential units, which is often exactly the kind of development that neighborhood associations will oppose. This is one of the big, big challenges getting in the way of climate responsive development and housing affordability, as Kelly was noting. So, um, oh sorry, I forgot my slides. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. 
Uh, this is just a little data on our survey here. You can go to the next slide. This is um, a little map showing that our headquarters in Borellis and then our two commercial projects, the Accessible Child Care Center and the, um, and the incubate, Infi Incubator in nearby. Next slide. Um, the incubator will include production space as well as affordable retail space. And we love this approach because it's really creating inclusive economic development opportunities. Next slide. A little picture of what it's going to look like. OK, last slide. Go ahead. So, um, you know, I think that Albuquerque has a lot to build off of. There's, this is a national conversation, obviously. This is a national challenge. Cities, some of them have been way ahead of the curve, and I think Albuquerque's got a lot to build off of with the IDEO zoning overhaul, which has really enabled a lot more density and flexibility. But I think much more can be done. As the American Planning Association notes, quote, Antiquated zoning laws are negatively impacting communities and effectively crippling housing choices by limiting opportunities, reinforcing segregation, driving up the cost of housing, and unfairly favoring single-family, low-density housing. It's even contributing to the worsening of the climate crisis. Fixing this development tool is imperative as planners work to bridge the racial wealth gap and increase economic opportunity for all. So we see a few clear ways that the city can act now, but there's more depth we could offer on these ideas if the interest uh, abounds. So the first is that we really believe in community responsive development, and we think that it's very important to find ways to engage residents to inform a citywide vision for growth and development, rather than engage um, as intensively on a project by project basis, which often slows important particularly mixed use or affordable housing projects down. We believe community voice is critical to shaping our city, but often the same voices are heard over and over, and those with less time, agency, and stability in their lives go unheard. Um, another low-hanging fruit is to continue to work to reduce parking requirements and where appropriate increased density, particularly on transit corridors. This is a great opportunity to add housing in association with transit that allows people to get where they need to go even without a car. We also would advocate for removing any ambiguity from rules that can allow for more varying interpretation at the staff level. In our experience, we've lost important time on community responsive projects um, when staff have interpreted uh, where there's room to, for example, increase parking requirements. These are unnecessary delays that slow down projects bringing affordable housing, job training, accessible childcare, or other much needed projects to the city. And um, a final simple step would be to release city-owned lots for infill development, sell them, or, or whatever the city's priority is, and, and ensure that those, the projects developed on those city-owned lots create new affordable housing and mixed-use developments. And this is something that could be done right now. Thank you so much for your time. Our next uh, presentation is from Bank on, or about Bank on Berkeley, presented by, this is an administration uh, uh, supported uh, project, uh, Family and Community Services, Kristen Chavez-Smith, and a presentation by Delma Madrigal from Bank on uh, Outreach Project Manager. All right, we can, can you hear me? Good, all right, perfect. If we can put up the first slide, please. Thank you. Council President, Council Members, my name is Delma Madrigal, and I am the Bank on Outreach Project Manager with the Office of Policy. Um, really happy to be here tonight to share with you about this project. Also with me today is Kristen Chavez-Smith, Community Services Division Manager with the Family and Community Services Department, who will be sharing about the Summer Jobs Connect Initiative, which Bank on Borque provides support for. So please let me tell you a little bit about Bank on Borque. Next slide. Launched in June of last year, Bank on Borque is an economic inclusion initiative for connecting individuals to safe and affordable checking accounts available in our community. The Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund provided grant funding to plan for and implement our Bank on initiative, ensuring that low cost, no overdraft, yes, that's right, I said no overdraft. No surprise fee bank and credit union accounts are an option for unbanked and underserved individuals. Next slide. 
Access to safe and affordable accounts is not just happening in Albuquerque, though. Banco Borque is part of a national network and is joined with almost 100 other coalitions taking part in this work. You may be wondering, do we need to have a Bank On initiative in Albuquerque? I'm gonna share a few reasons for why we do. Next slide. The first one is evident on this chart from Prosperity Now. The blue line at the bottom of the chart indicates the national change in unbanked households, and as you can see, it is trending downward, which that means that more people are getting banked nationally. The orange line at the top of the chart indicates how unbanked households are trending in Albuquerque. Next slide. Additionally, overdraft fees are something many of us have experienced or know someone who has. And how these fees impact vulnerable households is especially significant. 43% of vulnerable households with checking accounts report having overdrafted in the past year with 9.6 overdrafts on average. Next slide. Which aligns with what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says can price people out of banking. People who pay more than 10 overdraft fees per year end up paying nearly three quarters of all overdraft fees. And on average paid $380 in overdraft fees during the year. That's a lot of money from those who can least afford it. So that's enough bad news. Let's go back to the bank on accounts and what they offer. Next slide. Bank on certified accounts are safe for consumers. And good news is that these accounts are available to all individuals in our community and can be found in other parts of New Mexico as well as nationally. Although these accounts are geared towards low to moderate income individuals, there's no income requirement. Requirements are a physical address and identification is required by the financial institution. Which leads me to our financial institution partners. Next slide. Our financial institution partners are Bank of America, Chase, First Convenience Bank, Nucinda, Rio Grande, U.S. Bank, U.S. Eagle, and Wells Fargo. We are so appreciative of each and every financial institution partner that is part of our coalition, and we look forward to having other financial institutions join us in the future as well. Next slide. So projects like this can't happen without support for sharing information in our community. It truly takes a village, and several city departments have provided support for this project. The brochure, which you have a copy of, is available in several languages and is on the website. Hard copies are provided at presentations or by request. Also available is a list of our financial institution partners and their certified accounts. Next slide. Our website also rolled out when we launched last year. Our website pages are designed to be phone and printer friendly. Keep in mind that the information on all of these pages can be translated into other languages. And also featured on our website is a how-to video for how to navigate the website, which is also provided by our city HR department for new employee orientation. We are happy to share that, seven, that 736 new city employees have seen a presentation or viewed the video during their orientation. Next slide. The Office of Equity and Inclusion recently started sharing about Banco on Borque on their social media channels. We are very appreciative for their partnership in sharing financial tips, information about Banco on Borque, and how to find bank on accounts as well. As I said, it takes a village. So continuing with great partnerships for moving economic inclusion forward, Kristen will now share about our work with the SJC project so far. Thank you. You can go to the next slide. And just one more. So as part of my role with the city of Albuquerque, I oversee uh, one ABQ Youth Connect. Um, it was established in 2018 to, so that all the departments that serve youth and families could better communicate, leverage resources, and start new projects. So it started with what we call the big three departments that serve youth, which is parks and recreation, family and community services, and arts and culture. But we quickly learned that so many departments play a role in serving youth and families. 
So as you can see in our nice little flower here, these are the active participants of Youth Connect. We meet bi-weekly to come up with all sorts of new projects like the, the Youth Job Fair, like the summer um, State of the Summer Report that will be out later this week, um, as well as new and exciting programs. So next slide, please. And one of those new exciting programs is the Summer Jobs Connect grant. Um, we applied for this grant about a year ago in conjunction with Bank on Burge. Um, if you don't know already, uh, the city of Albuquerque employs about 1,200 youth employees in the summer. During the school year, it's about 600, so we double our numbers in the summer. Um, and as these young people come on, it's usually, or sometimes, their first job. And so they're coming into these jobs mm -hmm. unbanked um, or using their parents' bank accounts. So this grant will essentially create youth bank accounts that do not need an adult signature to create them. Um, they'll be used for direct deposit with the city of Albuquerque paychecks. There, there will be a $0 minimum to open the accounts. Um, as I said, no adult co-signer is necessary. They'll also have access to a debit card, so not just a pay card to go to the ATM, they'll actually have a debit card. And we're gonna include financial literacy training for all city youth employees as part of this grant. So we're really excited to get this going and we're hoping to launch here in the spring. And if there are any questions or anything else, we can take those now. Any questions, counselors? Comments? Counselor Sanchez. Thank you. Ms. O'Donnell, I, I, well, I'm sorry, it's uh, Delma. I have a question for Delma. Um, question Delma is that um, every bank has overdrafts that I've dealt with. You're talking 43.9% um, happen per year. So you're talking like 9.6, right? 9.6 overdrafts per year that a family might have or $300, $380 average on overdraft. I'm just curious how the city um, is funding the, that overdraft protection for people who obviously um, have some trouble with that. Right, so let me explain how the accounts work. So basically, it's a, it's a checklist checking account, right? And so you have a debit card, which is great, but when you go and uh, run your card through, and if there's not enough funds, it declines the card. And so I always tell folks, better to have a moment of embarrassment to have that card declined than to have a 35 typically a 35 dollar fee get thrown on top because usually what happens for some individuals is that it cascades right i always tell young people you know you go to mcdonald's and get that happy meal the value meal whatever they're not going to tell you you don't have enough money they're going to run the card through and then you go the next day for lunch that wendy's is not going to tell you they're going to run the card through and so what happens is you get these cascading fees right and so basically, that's how the card works. Okay, so basically, they just do the, they run the card. If there's no money in the card, that actually acts as an overdraft protection. Is that what you mean? Well, overdraft protection typically means that folks, it'll go into their savings and it'll pull money from their savings. So for individuals who don't have that overdraft protection, right? Because a lot of folks, a lot of people are, are living paycheck to paycheck, right? I think what we're seeing is that folks don't have a lot of money in their accounts. So if that safety protection is not in place, it's just going to decline the card. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jones. Thank you. You're talking about they'll take this out of their savings if they don't. What if they don't have savings? That's why I'm saying if there's no savings, it just declines the card. So they're back where they would be otherwise. Well, they're not getting the overdraft fee, though. So what happens with folks that don't have this card, they get $35 plus what they say they spent $8. So I have an article that's called the $36 hamburger. We had one uh, individual who shared a story where she was getting a dollar hamburger at a local place for her lunch, right? And so that dollar hamburger was actually costing her $36 every time because she was getting charged that overdraft fee every single time. If she had had this account, what would have happened is that it would have been declined and she would have known that she didn't have enough funds so that she could go check her account. Thank you. One more question. Are you along with this card and this work, are you counseling people on 
budgets and, and control of spending and some of the things, the basics that perhaps would keep all of this from happening? Uh, is, there any, is there any education involved with this? So we have another piece of this which we call our program integrations. So we have several program integration partners that we're piloting right now. So NMCAN, YDI, Tax Help New Mexico, and La Secumentario. We're looking for organizations that have financial education because this is the perfect place to be talking about these accounts in conjunction with financial education. So we're being very deliberate in the partnerships that we're seeking for working with us. And so we're not doing the education ourselves, but we're looking for those that are providing the financial education. But we are doing the financial education is gonna be in the Summer Jobs Connect project, and that one we will be doing some curriculum for. Thank you, I appreciate that answer, and that is the number one issue. It is the number one issue. We really need to make sure that we're able to do that. So we're just, you know, any financial education partners that are out there, when they hear about these accounts, they see it right away, and they're like, oh yeah, we gotta talk about these accounts during our financial education. Thank you. Thanks so much for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on. We have no economic development discussion tonight. We are going to go to general public comments. Mr. President. Uh, uh, yes, Vice President Lewis. Mr. President, I want to I move that we hear uh, M225 at this time in the council, at, at this time on the agenda before the general public comments. All right. I'll second. I'll second. Is that a change of the. Is that a, there's a motion and a second. Is that, that a change of the rules? Or uh, no issue there, just a straight vote? Mr. President, Councilor, and Council President, you can move items out of order on the agenda if you wish, or it could also be done by a vote of the Council. Okay. Uh, so, so it doesn't necessarily require a vote? Mr. Uh, President, if you'd agree to it, otherwise let's, let's move a vote. Okay. Uh, let's just uh, let's just go ahead and vote. Make sure everybody's copacetic with that. So that would be, again, rephrase it, uh, Councillor. We'll move M225 to this at this time in the agenda. Okay, this is a move up uh, M225 uh, on the agenda. All those in favor say yes. Uh, or we have to go to, uh, because we have a council calling in by Zoom, we have to go to a roll call vote. So, Ms. Hinojos. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. All right. Uh, we will move on then to move up, I should say, to. <clears throat> M7. Um, oh, excuse me, not M7, M5. So we're on M5, and Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. This is M5, urging the New Mexico State Legislature to repeal the New Mexico Rent Control Prohibition. Move do pass. And we have a second. Uh, second. I'll second that motion. And is there anyone signed up to speak? I believe there are quite a few people signed up to speak. Um, so uh, we will move then uh, at this point, I think directly to public comment. Uh, just to clarify, many of the people who have signed up to speak signed up also under general public comment. And, and uh, if you were speaking on this subject, uh, uh, we're not going to be duplicating the, the comment. Uh, so say your piece here, and it will not be discussed under general public. Um, so we'll get started. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Morgan Hobson, followed by Cameron Vallejos.
Hello, city councilors. Um, I am a counselor and I'm also an organizer of the People's Housing Project. I'm a tenant in District 2, Councilor Benton. I read on your website that you are an endorser of mental health and housing, so I know you'll be thrilled to vote yes to the memorial in support of thousands of residents. It is well proven that mental health is contingent upon access to affordable housing. I'm also excited for the counselors who advocate for family values to be able to support and vote yes for the memorial because it's proven that housing insecurity is the top factor in keeping families together, especially working class families. We know lack of access to affordable housing disproportionately affects indigenous, black, Latino, women, and LGBTQ people, which make up the majority of Albuquerque residents. So voting yes on the memorial is an opportunity to protect our families. Voting yes shows you care about demo democratic rights for the many, the local Albuquerque working families who build and clean our city, teach our kids, offer medical care, and so, so, so much more, instead of the few rich landlords who own housing to turn a profit. We have spent two weeks in the heat, in the rain, putting up over 30,000 door hangers to build with other tenants. Dozens of people have contacted us with the fear of becoming homeless. Hundreds are being impacted financially by rent hikes. Representing the majority and voting yes for the opportunity to have rent control if we need it, represent us, please, in doing so. Vote yes for democracy. Vote yes for mental health communities. Thank you. As I said before, we're not going to allow applause tonight. Uh, we'll be here until the early hours of the morning if we're going to applaud after every speaker. So I'm asking you to not applaud. As we warned earlier, people continue with that. You'll be asked to leave. So uh, let's, uh, let's move forward then. Thank you. Cameron Vallejos, followed by Danger Vados. Um, Cameron won't be able to get here till six if you could move her down. She just is stuck in work. Danger Vados, followed by Elisa Sanchez. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see you again. Uh, my name is Danger Vados. Uh, we've spoken before. I don't know if you remember 2019 Albuquerque Albuquerque's Best Comic. That's my kid in the back, literally sleeping right now. Um, uh, I'm, I am currently, or we are residents of Mr. President, Councillor Benton of your district, and, uh, but I have spent most of my life in either Councillor Davis or Councillor Pena's district, and um, I just want to discuss like a hypothetical about the proposed memorial by Councillor Feeblecorn, which I appreciate very much. Um, what if you passed the memorial? Would we get rent control in Albuquerque? No, we wouldn't. And what if at the state legislature they, they did what I hope and they overturned the ban on rent control? Would we get rent control in Albuquerque? No, we wouldn't get any of those things. What would happen is this body would be allowed to democratically decide for Albuquerque what is best for Albuquerque and how to deal with this humanitarian crisis which is exploding right now. Uh, and I have to tell you the truth, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether I voted for you or not, or whether I live in your district or not, I have absolute faith that every single one of you knows what's best for Albuquerque more than anybody in Santa Fe does and more than any special interest that's going to be here arguing uh, against me. Uh, so please vote for this memorial. It's going to be best for everybody. It's best for me. It's best for that little sleeping stinker in the back. And uh, I'd appreciate your vote very much. Thank you very much. The Alyssa Sanchez, followed by Annalie DeSonia. Thank you, counselors. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, the majority of low income households in New Mexico spend more than half their income on rent paid to landlords. Because of these large and frequent rent increases, our sisters and brothers are forcibly being removed from their historic communities and subsidizing the gentrification and hardships faced by New Mexican families. This prohibition is undemocratic and infringes on the local community's rights to make decisions about housing. The city council should stand with the majority of us who are middle to low income households and our right to have a say in setting the cost of rent. Not only does this affect housing, it also affects small business owners who rent a space to work from as they are at risk of shutting down due to rising rents. 
Lack of access to affordable housing disproportionately affects indigenous, black, and Latino residents, as well as women and LGBTQ plus people, which is the majority of New Mexico. My family struggles every day with being able to afford basic necessities like food, shelter, and, <laughs> and clothes <laughs> on a daily basis with the income we all receive. I have seen friends, family, and neighbors forced out of their homes with nowhere to go because there's no longer affordable to live. With the ban on rent control, there's no regard for where we will go or how our quality of life will be affected. The fact of the matter is, rents are increasing exponentially faster than the average wage of New Mexicans. We know you care about Albuquerque residents and are trying to do our best with Burqueños, which is why you should vote yes to show you care about our rights as tenants and fellow New Mexicans. Thank you. Anna Lee Desanier, followed by Cynthia <coughs> Rodriguez. Hello, my name is Anna Lee. I'm a proud Chicana, born and raised in Albuquerque. I would like to clarify a myth. Building more housing will create affordable housing. With no way to limit how much landlords can charge for rent, there is no way to guarantee affordable housing. Rent hikes inevitably displace locals and destroy Latino communities in cities across the US. We cannot let Albuquerque become the next gentrified city. I lived in Austin when, sky when rent skyrocketed. I tried to leave an abusive partner but found myself in crisis, unable to find affordable shelter and safety. Because of this, I endured many more months of abuse. Women are forced to stay in abusive relationships because housing is unaffordable. Please stand with the majority who are not landlords. Wealthy landlords do not care about Albuquerque the way we know you do. We must define Albuquerque's success by how many families stay housed, how many women escape abuse because rent is affordable, how many children get to grow up in the same district instead of their parents having to move to find cheaper rent. There is not a number high enough that money-hungry developers should be able to throw at us to make us risk losing our people and our culture. I know every counselor can proudly and enthusiastically vote yes for women, yes for Chicanos, yes for this memorial. Thank you. Cynthia Rodriguez, powered by Dean Shelton. Hi, my name is Cynthia Rodriguez, and I live in District 9. I'm asking you to vote yes on City Council Bill MM25, urging the New Mexico State Legislature to repeal rent the prohibition on rent control. We are seeing workers and local business, business owners get hit hard with skyrocketing rent prices. The cost of rent has increased 40% since 2020. Our most oppressed and vulnerable neighbors are being hit the hardest by this housing crisis. 23% of the estimated over 2,800 homeless people in Albuquerque are indigenous. Indigenous people only make up 4.5% of the city's population. 9% of the homeless population is black, while black people only account for 3.1% of our city's population. 67% of homeless, 67% uh, uh, are chronically homeless. 9% are veterans, and 46% report having mental illness. These numbers are only growing, and they will only continue to grow as long as we allow landlords and developers to eat up available housing and price gouge the cost of rent. I'm asking you to stand with the residents of Albuquerque to urge the state of New Mexico to repeal the rent control prohibition. Thank you. Dean Shelton, followed by Nicholas Brimmer. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. I'm 71 and I live on Social Security supplemented by a part-time job. I live alone and I rent a small apartment in the Borellis neighborhood. I have less than one year's living expenses in reserve. My rent has gone up <clears throat> twice in four years, unlike my wage. And my apartment building recently sold to an out-of-state investor. The new owner has been vague about their plans for the building and the tenants are concerned that we may see a significant increase in rent. At this time, it's unlikely that I would even qualify for subsidized housing 
I would most likely end up on the street before I could secure housing through that system. No one should be not denied housing based on their inability to pay. Housing is a basic human need and a human right. No one should have to live on the street, nor should we tolerate or normalize it by offering to create so-called safe outdoor spaces. There is nothing safe about living on the streets. The current prohibition on rent control allows landlords to set prices according to profit-driven motives and not human need, and it shuts us out of any process to demand and negotiate affordable housing. This is simply undemocratic and inhumane. It gives landlords absolute authority to exclude with impunity you, people in need up. of housing. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Nicholas Rimmer, followed by Karina Rogers. Hello again, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nicholas Rimmer. I'm a member of the legal community and organizer with the People's Housing Project. I'm also a resident of uh, President Benton's district. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to come up and dispel uh, some of the myths around what we are trying to do here today. Uh, as you've heard, uh, what we are asking for is that the democratic rights uh, be returned to the people to decide in local communities whether or not to have rent control. Uh, you know, one of the common uh, arguments against, uh, you know, even having a, a democratic process to decide if rent control should be allowed or not is that controlling rents on some housing uh, units uh, to, to ensure that they're affordable actually drives up the rents uh, on those units. Um, but this is an obvious attempt at disinformation. We're going to hear about it tonight, I'm sure. At the end of the day, uh, if and when rents go up uh, in uncontrolled areas, it is because of exclusive decision of landlords and developers. They sent the rental amounts according to what is most profitable for themselves at any given, given moment. And as a community, we should be able to decide if we are going to choose uh, people over profits. Uh, you know, across New Mexico, where, where rent control is currently illegal, rent has increased 13.5% in 2021. In the Albuquerque metro area, where 44% of New Mexicans live, average rent increased a crushing 26% in 2021. Now in 2022, rents have gone up 40% since 2020. Thank you. Karina Rogers, followed by Jennifer Merriman. The last time I came here to be heard, I saw an elderly homeless couple out front of here on my way in. If your response to this is to hire more police to clear them from your conscience, you should not be in any position of authority at all. This real estate market aided by banks and insurance companies has increased the values to the point that they are worth more than life itself. And that is a moral failure of the highest magnitude. Speaking for myself, I have not much faith at all left in this system that you all represent because I do not believe that you represent me, but instead developers, investors, and corporate interests, not people. And I saw an example of that just here tonight when HomeWise got to talk all they wanted to, and so did the bank, and you all had to listen to them, but we only get two minutes to speak, and we don't get to clap. Okay? So if you still care about my vote, then this is your opportunity to prove me wrong. Vote yes on the memorial. Vote to overturn the ban on rent control. That would be the very least thing you could do. Jennifer Merriman, followed by Jaden Moore. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm a resident and small business owner in District 2. I was born and raised in Albuquerque, PHP organizer, and a homegrown small business owner. Many local small business owners, like myself, rent a space for their businesses or work from home from a rental. Because rents are out of control, small businesses are shutting down, and more are struggling to keep up with rental costs. Homegrown small businesses, businesses are unable to thrive when housing and commercial spaces are too expensive. Will Albuquerque become a place where only big businesses can operate? 
Will local entrepreneurs no longer stand against larger outside corporations? Do we want a city where local business owners have the right to decide what rent costs? Or will we be priced out, giving big business the upper hand in crushing Albuquerque residents' dreams? Voting yes for the memorial means you put Albuquerque residents' democratic rights, their small businesses, and their housing needs first over an out-of-state investor's portfolio. First over an out-of-state investor's portfolio, Albuquerque small businesses. I know you love Albuquerque just as much as I do, so vote yes so we can take action to protect our local community and restore democracy by saying workers and small business owners should have the right to decide rents so we can stay housed and stay in business. Thank you. Jaden Moore, followed by Ben Indus. Hello, council members. My name is Jaden, and I am a student and an organizer with the People's Housing Project. First off, if the city is being flooded with cash right now, we can build and guarantee our own permanently affordable public housing by New Mexicans for New Mexicans. Take out the middleman. We don't need developers to provide for our people. We don't want our city to be gentrified at our expense and don't want to be displaced by outside developers pricing us out. We shouldn't worry that ending the prohibition on rent control will scare away investors and developers. If developers are afraid of Albuquerque because they can't charge whatever they want for rent, it means that they don't really care about Albuquerque residents. It means they only care about their profits. We know that you all care about Albuquerque residents, not just landlords and developers. That is why we are asking you to join us in urging the state legislator to end, legis legislature to end the prohibition on rent control so that local communities like ours can have the democratic right to enact rent control if we deem it necessary. Show your support by, for Albuquerque residents by voting yes on the memorial. Thank you. Ben Indus, followed by Jeremiah Montoya. Hello, my name is Ben. I've spent the past 10 years working in and living mostly in the Corzon 40 area of District 1. Um, I work at a middle school right in that area. And my school has students who are homeless and many more families who are housing insecure. Um, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, but students who don't have homes are not going to be able to succeed in school. If, if they are not able to get to school, if they are not able to take care of their hygiene, if they are not able to sleep at night, they're not going to be, we are denying them an education. Um, and our city, currently our city, as they've said, does not even have the right to make rent protections for these families. So please vote yes on the memorial. Urge the state legislators to repeal the ban. And before I leave, I want to share some of the rent increases in the cores in 40 area. La Terraza Apartments has gone up, will have gone up $100 rent come February. Mesa Ridge has gone up $175. Stride Apartments, formerly Broadstone Ladera, has gone up $225 within the last year. And La Dera Vista has gone up about $300 for some residents. This is unacceptable. Please vote yes. Jeremiah Montoya, followed by Kevin Brannan. Good evening. I am a tenant in District 6, and I have lived in Albuquerque my whole life. I have two roommates and have to share a room with one because I can't afford rent. I am here today to speak about the undemocratic prohibition on rent control. I work at Central New Mexico Community College, and every single day I deal with students who are facing a housing crisis, whether that, th that be that they have just been or are about to be evicted. The common thread is the same. They are raising rent, and people who have lived here their entire lives are being pushed out. Last month, I spent over two hours helping a disabled student look for housing she could afford. Her budget is less than $500 a month. It cannot go above that because she suffered a traumatic brain injury and cannot work. We called every single apartment we could find, and they all gave us the same answer. We have raised rent. This is just one student. I have spoken to many more in this exact same circumstance. Many of these students are members of already vulnerable populations. Just this morning, I spoke with a homeless veteran. The city and state are flushed with cash. Shouldn't we be using that excess to improve lives for the majority of people living in Albuquerque? 
We know you care about residents. Please open the path to letting us everyday people decide our rent costs instead of letting corporations drive us out by pricing us out. Please vote yes on the memorial. Kevin Branham, followed by Thomas Harris. Hello, my name is Kevin. I'm a longtime resident of Albuquerque, and I live in District 1. And uh, I was lucky enough to recently be able to purchase a home, but I was only able to do that due to a large uh, amount of uh, financial support from a family member. Uh, I've met hundreds of community members over the um, across the city over the past few months, and I've talked with them about housing issues, rising rents, and how they've been affected by the crisis. The average 40% increase in rent is unprecedented. Wages are not keeping up, and our neighbors are being driven into homelessness. I've only met a small handful of people who told me they didn't have any serious problems with housing, but just about all that I've talked to know or have known at least one person whose life has been devastated. These are our neighbors, our families, our family members. The current ban on rent control in New Mexico makes it impossible for residents to have any say in setting the costs of rent. It is completely undemocratic and only ensures that a few people can afford a place to live while more and more of us are forced out of our homes and onto the streets. While this memorial does not enact rent control, it does support making it an option and that is a step in the right direction. We know you care about the people in our community. Please do the right thing and pass this memorial. Thank you. Thomas Harris, followed by Jose Enriquez. Hello. Um, hello. Uh, um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Harris Jr. I live here in about 21 years, and uh, and I also am a member of the PSP. I had uh, traveled all over the city, and I most mostly found out the exact same story of people being moved, forced to move and unable to afford their current rents. They, are, they have often compl have, uh, had, well, they often had very long discussions with their landlords on whether or not they, it was worth it to have to pay $200 in, in a numerous fees, among other things. Um, there's also the fact that many of the tenants are unable to move from their situations. Uh, some of them are, are, are quite uh, terrible, or they have uh, they often have uh, unable to, uh, to live. Um, often have particular issues. Many of them, for example, are living in vultures, I mean, health vouchers, and are stuck to where they are, unable to uh, move on to the another location. As this is a problem throughout our whole city. Um, I'm asking you to vote yes on the memorial uh, and to uh, uh, the, ask the state to appeal the state provision on rent control. Uh, and I also... Uh, thank you, sir. Your, like your time's to, expired. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Jose Enriquez, followed by Ramona Malkasinski. Good evening. My name is Jose Enriquez. I'm a tenant in District 2, and I'm a member of Southwest Carpenters Lo Local 1319. I urge this council to pass Council Bill M225. The council should stand with the majority, the working class, and not rich landlords, and our right to have a say in setting the cost of rent. The city of Albuquerque has given $77.5 million to Titan Development this year. Titan Development is charging $1,600 $50 a month for studio apartments. In order to afford rent at a place like this, I, a journeyman carpenter, would have to pay almost half my income. For a non-union carpenter, and most residential builders are non-union, it would be a larger portion of their income. This is ridiculous. It is a tragedy that the workers who carry these luxury apartments piece by piece with their shoulders and bodies and create this wealth for rich developers like Titan with their hands and minds cannot afford to live in these apartments. 
We do not want Albuquerque to become the next city where working class neighborhoods and communities are destroyed and displaced by gentrification. Tammy has introduced a memorial that speaks to the needs of everyday residents, and we love it. Stand with workers who can't afford to live in the apartments that they built. Pass Council Bill M225. Ramona Malkusinski, followed by Jordan Newlander. Good evening, my name is Ramona Malchinski. I was born and raised in Albuquerque and live in District 2. I'm on the bargaining committee of my union, the United Graduate Workers of UNM, which has endorsed this mobilization to city council. Albuquerque is facing an unprecedented housing crisis with rents skyrocketing without limit. Thousands of Albuquerque residents are unhoused or on the edge of homelessness. We need to be able to use all the tools in our toolbox to address this crisis. Voting yes on the memorial urging the state legislature to repeal the prohibition on rent control will show Albuquerque residents that this council is earnestly seeking a solution to our housing crisis that affects us all. It will not enact rent control, but will send an important message to the state legislature from the largest city in our state, where 40% of residents are renters. Albuquerque residents, are looking to you to do what's right and simply state that our community should have the ability to make democratic decisions about housing rather than be restricted by a blanket prohibition from the state. We know addressing the crisis will involve various policies, including building safe, clean, affordable, and dignified public housing, and our community should not be limited by a ban on rent control that does not consider the needs of people in Albuquerque. So vote yes on the memorial on M225. Once again, I'm in District 2. Thank you. Jordan Newlander, followed by Joshua Price. Hello. Uh, my name is Jordan, and I'm a, an organizer with the People's Housing Project, as well as a full-time student at UNM. Um, I've seen a lot of initiatives to build more affordable housing in Albuquerque, the housing for Albuquerque. Kirky Initiative being one of them. Um, the solution to the housing crisis is not to build more housing. Since March of 2020, um, the average rent in Albuquerque has increased by around 40%. People have no autonomy over their housing, over where they live, or how much their rent is. If most of the people, uh, if most of the houses and apartments are still privatized, if they are still being used to generate profit, then they are still going to actively be displacing um, residents by their landlords. PNC, Graysaw, these corporations don't care about their tenants. They've been raising rent. They will continue to raise rent. They do not take care of their tenants, and they will continue to displace Albuquerque residents, as it, adding to the active housing crisis here. The solution is to give autonomy to people over their rent, and I and all of the people People's Housing Project, urge you to please vote yes on Council Bill um, M225. Thank you. Joshua Price, followed by Candace Yenes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the Council. Thank you for accepting the time. Uh, my name is Joshua Price. I am a realtor. I'm a property manager. Um, I represent somewhere over 280 different people just like you and these people in the room that own one property and own it as an investment that tries to better their lives. Um, what I can tell you, and, and I'm a renter as well, I do not own my own property, but I manage properties and I make sure that people get housed. Um, the vast majority of property managers do not raise rents other than when the market dictates, because the market dictates. I can tell you that three years ago, if you came to me and you said, Josh, I have a house and I want to rent it for $2,000 a month, I'd say, Good luck, it's gonna sit on the market forever. We're never gonna rent it. And that's just money you're leaving on the table. The reason being is that that $2,000 would be a half a million dollar mortgage. And why would you be renting at all if you could just go and pick up whatever house you had because you had income and, you, and it just didn't make sense. The market dictates everything. We live and we work in a free market. Milk goes up, gas goes up. We don't get to dictate attorney's fees. We don't get to dictate doctor's fees. We don't get to dictate cost of living. 
So why would we be taking an investment away from a person that owns one property? I'll give you a story. I've got an old lady who has a home that she owned, lived in her whole life. She is now renting that house out so that she can pay for her medication because her social Thank security you, pays for her rent. But if we didn't have that Thank income you, to her, expired. she wouldn't have to live. Got to think about this. Candice Yanez, followed by Jordan Alvarenga. Hello, my name is Candace Yanez. I am a tenant in District 2 and also a elementary school teacher in a low-income neighborhood in District 6. I'm here to ask you to vote for M225, the memorial to end the prohibition on rent control because um, housing insecurity and homelessness is affecting my students. These are 10 and 11-year-olds who are constantly being chronically absent because they're being displaced, being evicted. We just had an apartment complex that was demolished and now we have 100 students and we have no idea where they are. Um, their health is being affected because they don't have a place, a, place, a safe place for themselves. Um, their performance is being affected at my job because they don't have a home to rest their head. These are 10, 11 year olds, and this is a good majority of, of people who are unhoused and housing insecure. This is the face of homelessness in Albuquerque, and we can't allow this to continue. Um, I know we all care about our kids in this, this city, and I all know we would want what's, what's best for the kids in our city and in our neighborhoods. Voting yes on the memorial to end the prohibition on rent will make my students and their families have hope and feel like their voices have have been heard. Thank you. Jordan Alaverenga, followed by Lori Trujillo. Hi, my, hello. Hi, my name is Jordan Antonio Alvarenga. My district is 11, and I'm urging you to vote yes to pass MM25. Um, uh, district 11 is Represented by Javier Martinez, I urge you to vote yes. My rent has increased $235 since Deacon Property Services has been given the opportunity to do so. Javier, you share a name with my hero, my brother, Charles Javier Alvarenga, who with this prohibition on rent will stay in financial destitute and injure his chance on becoming a doctor, a Latino doctor, that of which only makes 5.8% of all healthcare positions as of 2019. This prohibition on creating a healthy, vital community of safe and diverse people will continue to fracture not only my living situation, but all community members in Albuquerque. The city can't, can't sprinkle slogans of hope around town to hide the agony of its people. Albuquerque, Albuquerque needs help today, not tomorrow. Please help us today by passing MM25. Artists, doctors, healers, and heroes are all asking you. My brother and I live in the same units, so options and opportunities are leaving the both of us. Thank you. Lori Trujillo, followed by Margo Lopez. Um, Lori is one of our elders who had a rent raise, and she's a little sick today, but she should be joining um, from her phone at... Sorry, 720-3241. Hello, my name is Margo Lopez and I live in District 3. However, I'm a social worker, so I spend most of my time traveling through all of the districts all around the city. I'm here to urge city council members to pass MM or M225. So I have a client from District 7 whose landlord just decided not to renew their lease so she could make a profit on a house that they were living in um, due to rising rents in that area. And last week, that client was hit by a car while she was panhandling after getting kicked out of her house so that she could pay for a motel room for herself and her children. I have a client in District 1 whose only income is general assistance. 
They care for three children and several grandchildren, and because of the high cost of their rent, even with housing assistance, they're unable, they would be unable to pay their rent if they lost their voucher, and they can't pay their utilities bills. Because of this, their utilities are about to be shut off, and if that happens, then the county will end their voucher, leaving them, their children, and gr grandchildren homeless. I have a client in District 6 who just had a new landlord take over their apartment building. After six years of being homeless, they just moved in and have been doing very well in their recovery. However, because this new landlord wants to raise the rent on their small four unit apartment complex, it'll price them and three other tenants out of that complex who are all also living on housing vouchers. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Lori Trujillo, followed by Joe Farr. Lori, can you unmute, please? I guess we'll try to come back to you. Joe Farr, followed by Todd Clark. My name is Joe Farr. I, uh, I'm not a property, uh, a, a multifamily property owner. I don't manage multifamily property, but I am in commercial real estate. I've been doing it for 40 some years. Rent control, even though you've heard a lot of very passionate stories that make a lot of sense <coughs> to people, that feel it in their heart, it is not the solution. If anything, it makes things worse. It's, it, 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 <clears throat> the situation that really happens if you were to implement rent control, you have, a, you have uh, all the incentive for property developers to build more units goes away. St. Paul, Minnesota just uh, maybe a year ago passed rent control. 85% of their multifamily permits disappeared. So what you're doing is you're transferring the problem from the current generation to the next generation. Nobody's gonna build more units because it doesn't make sense financially. Over the last 20 years, the average increase in the cost of rent is somewhere around 2.7% per year. That includes over the last couple of years when it's gone up dramatically. But it's gone up dramatically because inflation has caused utility rates, cost of labor, everything else to go up which is causing those property owners to raise their rates. If you, if you implement rent control, it's gonna cause a bigger problem down the road. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Todd Clark, followed by Ricky Farrell. City Councilors, my name is Todd Clark. I'm the fourth generation of my family to do commercial real estate here in downtown Albuquerque. I live in Councilor Benton's district. Uh, my family's been practicing commercial real estate over, for over 100 years. And we've uh, mapped in recent times five housing shortages. The housing shortage we have today is due to the phenomenal success we've had as a community in recruiting new jobs. Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, Meta, Intel, the list goes on and on. In your briefing book, if you look on the back of the page, it says CASA. It lists all of the jobs for you. We need 19,000 rental units and 35,000 new single family units to meet the demand for these jobs. And if we don't, Rent control is not going to create new units. Price control on single family houses isn't going to create new units. Only new units will create new units. And until we're in a marketplace where you have more people, uh, I'm sorry, where you have more units than you do people, you're going to continue to have rent increases. Thank you for your time. Ricky Farrell, followed Wait, by. Just as a reminder, everybody on both sides. You know, we will ask that you leave the chambers if you continue with applause. We don't have time for it tonight. Mr. President, I think also our rules of decorum uh, require that we just have one person at the podium at a time and uh, that everybody else would be seated. Ricky Farrell, followed by Alan Lisek. Mr. President, I'm not sure the vicinity of that or what you'd like to do on that, but I, I, I do think that's probably a violation of our rules.
Councilors, any any concerns about that? Thanks. Yeah, if you don't mind, just over right over here in the corner. And Mr. President, I think someone was filming there last week, and they were asked to leave as well. So I'm not sure. I, I think what that's the appropriate for place reason, would be. Counselor. Okay. All right. So please proceed. My name is Ricky Farrell. I live in District Seven. I'm a graduate student at UNM and a member of the United Graduate Workers Union, who supports Council Bill M225. I have heard so many of my fellow graduate workers tell me that they can barely afford rent hikes. Last year, their stipends cover, most of their stipends went to covering rent. This year, their entire stipend is going to their rent and they have nothing left over. This past May, in the middle of finals, myself and several other students were forced to move out of our housing, a place that specifically marketed itself to students because the new landlords didn't want the property to be geared towards housing students anymore. I was lucky I had a friend who was alone in a two bedroom and willing to take on a roommate, otherwise I might not have been able to continue my studies at UNM. Landlords, especially large out of state corporations, do not care about how their decisions affect local tenants so long as they meet their profit goals. We know you care about locals. Voting yes shows you care about our democratic rights. I want to thank Councillor Feeblecorn for proposing this memorial. I urge you all to join her in helping end the prohibition on rent control because it is undemocratic and infringes on local communities' rights to make decisions about housing. Thank you. Alan Lisek, followed by Zoe Johnson. Council President and uh, Council Members, thank you very much. My name is Alan Lisek, and I'm uh, the Executive Director of the Apartment Association in New Mexico. Uh, I, as well, am a lifelong resident of Albuquerque. I'm born and raised. In fact, I've lived my entire life in District 7, rented for many years in District 7. And, uh, you know, we definitely acknowledge that uh, rents have increased. But so, you know, unfortunately, so has everything else. And rent control is not the answer. Um, even suggestion of rent control has negative effects. Rent control negatively impacts the housing market by discouraging construction of new housing, expediting the deterioration and loss of existing housing, and diminishing the value and investment in properties. As you've heard over the past week tonight and tonight, uh, rent control does not just impact the rental housing industry. The negative economic impact is immense. Without new developments and the remodeling of aging properties, many citizens are left without work. Uh, this list includes architects, engineers, Building inspectors, construction companies, masons, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, roofers, painters, carpet installers, glazers, so many more. Um, these are your neighbors, your friends, and most importantly, the residents of Albuquerque. Just two years ago, the city of Albuquerque funded a research that found Albuquerque was over 15,000 units short. Turning off our supply to new housing would be disastrous for us as a community. The solutions to higher cost of housing are not price controls, the answer is to increase the supply of housing. It's the law of supply and demand. So let's work together, streamline permitting process, make it easier Thank to build, you, sir, give help to those in need, Thank you. and Mr. invest Mr. in New Mexico. Mr. President, Alan, if you'd like to finish that comment, and I do have a question for you. Uh, Alan, yeah. And I, and I, I appreciate you all. Um, you know, I hope you get the same respect. I know that you've all been giving everybody in this room uh, with, with listening intently to all the comments. I know that I, I'm listening intently to all the comments, no matter what side you're on on this. But So thank you. Um, but you mentioned, um, so talk about just the example of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and there was a similar uh, rent cap. Uh, proposal that's been implemented for a good while at St. Paul. I understand there was about a 30% um, reduction in new home starts, new housing starts, and that is the goal here. I mean, we really want new starts, new housing, certainly new multi-housing. Um, we want many opportunities so we could lift out of people out of poverty uh, by incentivizing you know people to invest in this community. And so uh, are you familiar with just what the, the impacts, I understand some detrimental impacts of what that did to St. Paul and what they're doing now? Yeah, so in St. Paul, um, they actually, on a four-year average, it was down 30%, um, but the first three months after being enacted, uh, they were down 80% year over year. 
Um, and meanwhile, in Minneapolis, right across the river where there is no rent control, construction was up 60%. Thank you. Zoe Johnson, followed by Steve Grant. Hi, I am a tenant in District 7 and an organizer with the People's Housing Project, but most importantly, I'm a student teacher. I had to move across town this year because my rent for my 400 square foot apartment went up $400 with zero notice and zero upgrades done to my apartment to show for it. That's $400 that as both a struggling student and a struggling teacher, I cannot afford. I don't want to see any more of my students or my neighbors go homeless. Please vote yes on the memorial to end the prohibition on rent control. The unprecedented increase in rents is forcing Albuquerque residents into homelessness. The best way to combat homelessness is to prevent it. At least 40% of Albuquerque residents are tenants. That is almost half the city. There are far fewer landlords. Please represent the majority, which is the tenants, so we can democratically enact controls on how much landlords can charge us for rent. Thank you. Steve Grant, followed by Kent Cravens. Hello once again, City Council President Benton and Councilors. My name is Steve Grant, I'm a property owner here in the area for the last 20 years, just several blocks from here. Serving as the president of the Apartment Association, representing thousands of small to large property owners throughout New Mexico has been a great honor. Lastly, I want to thank, uh, or also I want to thank um, the, being a member of the Housing uh, Advisory Board that I was on uh, over this last year. The last 20 years of being a small property owner has been challenging, keeping up with the overall, overall cost of repairs and maintenance. Security doors that once were $75 are now 152 Evaporative coolers that once were 375 are now 575. I think we can all agree that housing is a major challenge these days. Therefore, therefore, we all need to come up with ideas and solutions to help and not hurt our city. The repeal of rent control is not the answer. These are questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Is repealing the rent control a real solution? That's what we need. If indeed evidence shows that rent control stops or slows development, this affects local businesses like plumbing and electrical companies. The National Apartment Association has found substantial evidence that when you make rent control the law, the overall housing development that you see will literally disappear. The idea of repealing rent control is not going to move the needle in the right direction that you may think. If anything, it will do just the opposite or slow growth or stop growth. We look forward to working with each of you and the administration and state leaders to develop solutions to help Please vote no on this rent control. Mr. Thank Grant, you. Uh, Mr. Grant, no, just a moment. There's a question from Councilor Lewis. And you, you mentioned you're on the House, Housing Authority Advisory Committee, and we, in fact, had a, had a presentation from them. Fifteen days ago meeting. you did, yes, Yeah, sir. pretty pretty long presentation for them. And again, I'm sorry you're not getting the same kind of respect from other people in this room um, by, that, that, uh, that you've given them, you know, not turning your back on them. But uh, you serve on that advisory board, and then... Um, uh, and it was a long presentation a few weeks ago uh, by them. I think a very good presentation about, about what we can do to change everything uh, in New Mexico when it comes to providing new housing and being able to incentivize investment into our city. Uh, but was, was rent control one of the solutions? They had, they had, a, you had a lot of suggestions from the housing authority. Was rent control one of those? It was not a what, solution. What were some of the other um, uh, proposals? What were the top proposals um, from the housing authority as far as to ensure that investment comes into this community so that we can provide more multi-housing and housing so that we can lift people out of poverty and give people choices and opportunities for affordable housing. That is correct. Thank you. Yeah. Did, did you have some other suggestions that the Housing Authority had uh, or, or some that come no, to mind? No, I just know that uh, last week or 15 days ago, as of tonight, there was a presentation by uh, MFA and the Housing and so, uh, as you were aware, um, there were there was a presentation and there were solutions that we worked on for over a year that we felt like were good ones to help this housing solution that we have, or help this housing issue that we have, I should say, provide solutions. There are solutions out there. We need to work together as an association, as developers, as property owners to help uh, guide the way to make things good for all of us as citizens of this great city. Thanks. And, and you all set the tone. 
Thanks. Again, I apologize. You're not getting the same kind of respect and attention that we're giving everybody in this room. Appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you. Kent Cravens, followed by Tony Lay Ponick. Uh, President uh, Benton and uh, members of the council, thank you very much for uh, entertaining uh, the uh, memorial this evening. Uh, as well-intentioned as it may be, uh, I, I represent the uh, the Greater Albuquerque Association of Realtors, Realtors, I'm the executive director there. And uh, Mr. President, members, I, I don't want to repeat what's already been said in opposition uh, to this memorial. I just want to add uh, to that that um, there's 4,300 members of the Greater Albuquerque Association of Realtors, approximately 7,500 members of the state association, and around the country there's a million 500,000 realtors that are our neighbors, our friends, our family, uh, Everybody knows a realtor, and uh, they're, they're the fabric of our community, and they're the voice for organized real estate. Uh, I, will, I will echo the fact that we do believe in um, uh, that rent control will slow the economy, will put the brakes on development, and that's not something that will solve our problem. What will solve the problem is if we do come together uh, for solutions, uh, s several of which we've seen in the mayor's proposal uh, coming out uh, in bits and pieces that we're picking up on. I just want to tell you that the National Association of Realtors, the State Association, and your local association, the Greater Albuquerque Association of Realtors, stand in firm support of developing new rooftops in whatever form that might come. We really like some of the ideas we're hearing, and uh, we, are, we, are stand, we will stand in full support of that. Thank you. Tony Lay Ponick, followed by Marissa Cedillo. Good evening. I am Tony Lee Ponick, and I live in Council Grouts District 9. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I am a small business owner. I own a boutique real estate and property management company. This memorial is be that is being proposed will be detrimental to the rental community. My owners are not corporate large investors. In fact, 95% of my owners own one to three properties. These owners have purchased these properties for their retirement. They care, they care for their properties. They make repairs and necessary upgrades. With rent control in place, how does the landlord cover their expenses of owning the home? As we know, property taxes increase every year along with homeowners insurance, maintenance costs, et cetera. With the increase in these expenses and not being able to raise rents to cover some of those expenses, the properties start to lose money. A property owner will do their best to survive with the margins so slim. They will either decide to not maintain the property or sell the property, which is a tough decision. In my rental portfolio this year, I've sold 15 properties, four of which only remained as rentals, which only exaggerates the need for more rental units. There was a study completed in 2018 in the Brookings Institute on rent control and its failures. The summary concludes that rent control appears to help affordability in the short run for current tenants, but in the long run decreases affordability. Please Thank vote you. no. Thank you for your time. Marissa Cedillo, followed by Paul Silverman. Hello. My name is Marisa Cedillo and I live in District 6. I am asking the council to vote yes on this memorial. Whenever I think of affordable access to housing, my mind goes to single mothers in abusive relationships who are bound to their abuser because they have to keep a roof over them and their kid's head. If housing is affordable, housing won't be a chain that ties one to someone who abuses them. In a world where there is affordable housing, Housing will be freeing to those who need to leave their domestic situations. I am asking the council directly, every single one of you, to stand with victims of abuse and stand with everyone in their respective districts. Housing is a human right. Thank you. Paul Silverman, followed by Victoria Carrion. Victoria Carrion, followed by Lana Smittle. Oops, I only missed the first name. Oh, sorry. 
gorgeous. Um, hello, my name is Victoria Carrion. Um, I'm a marketing manager and I work from home, which means where I live is super important. Um, I live in a two bed, two bath in District 1. Um, and when I moved in in 2021, my rent was 814. Now I pay 992 for the same unit. There have been no upgrades, no changes. Um, to continue living there um, comfortably without additional stress, I had to switch jobs, leaving behind work at a nonprofit that I found extremely meaningful. Um, please note, this is not an option for everyone. Some people are unable to work because they are on fixed incomes due to disability or um, they are elderly um, and they're being impacted as well. Um, higher rents means more sacrifices for residents and less people able to remain in their homes. Like the single mother of three below me and the uh, two young women of color below her who just moved out. Um, basically, half of my unit or half of my apartment complex is switching every few months. Um, and I just want to be able to want my neighbors and myself to be able to afford to remain where we are. Um, so please stand with the renters of Albuquerque and Plas N22-5 as a part of comprehensive way of addressing the housing crisis that includes uh, rent control and addressing housing availability through development. I think there's a way that we can uh, do it all to help everyone. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. Lana Smittle, followed by Joel. Gallegos. Good evening, Council President Benton, the city councilors. My name is Lana Smittle, and I'm here representing the Home Builders Association of Central New Mexico. We oppose Memorial M-22-5. Rent control negatively impacts the housing market by discouraging construction of new housing. We need solutions that will provide more housing, not less. Rent control will drive developers and landlords out of the market, which means there won't be housing. We can work together for real solutions. The solution to a higher cost of housing is not price controls. The, the, the real answer is to increase the supply of housing. We do have some solutions. Speed up plan checks, building inspections and approvals, create incentives for more developers to enter the market, even incentivize CNM to create more two-year certificates for construction-related trades labor to help with the skilled labor shortage. We look forward to working with you on all of these solutions. Thank you. Joel Callegos, followed by Nathan Todd. Hello, I'm from District 7. Please vote yes to urge the state to repeal the prohibition on rent control. On my way here, I counted 17 homeless people. These are people of Albuquerque. I've lived in Albuquerque my whole life. My mom was a single parent. She got good grades in school, and she worked two jobs. She did this to provide for me and my three other siblings. Still, she's dealing with finding affordable housing. Lack of affordable housing disproportionately affects indigenous, black and Latino residents, women, and LGBT, LGBTQ people. Housing is a human right. My rent went up recently $300. I'm expecting it to go up $600. I'm the only provider. I have, live in a studio apartment. My studio apartment, right now my swamp cooler is out. Please vote yes. Nathan Todd, followed by Cameron Martinez. Cameron Martinez, followed by Brianna Gianni. Giannini. Hello. Uh, I want to start by saying that I live in uh, District 6. Um, and that voting yes to this memorial is what the people of Albuquerque need. Uh, if you do not vote yes, you are not helping the majority of people here. You would be helping the small amount of rich landlords who do not care about anything except for profit. Don't you think that the city and state should be putting more money towards building good quality, affordable, and public housing? Currently, I am fortunate 
enough to be able to live with my parents during this housing disaster because I cannot afford the raising apartment prices. Without them, I would be forced to pay ridiculous amounts for a tiny place. As much as I love my parents, I don't want to live with them forever. I guarantee I'm not the only one in this situation. And I'm just lucky enough I have people to fall back on. A lot of people do not have this, have it, have it and this, uh, have it this good and are all on their own. We need to solve home, home, homelessness here in Albuquerque. So again, I urge you to please vote yes on the M22 bill. Brianna Giannini, followed by Laura Olivas. Um, hello, my name is Brenna Giannini. I am a tenant in District 2, and I am urging the City Council to vote yes on Council Bill M225. I've lived in New Mexico my whole life, and I've known so many people, including my family and close friends, that have struggled to stay in their homes or their areas even, due to increasing rents. One of those people is my closest friend who, uh, who gave me permission to tell her story today. She has custody of her younger brother and has to work three jobs to support herself and him, so she couldn't be here today. Last winter, her landlord increased her rent by $125 a month, which made it impossible for her to afford to stay, uh, to afford to stay, so they had to scramble to find housing in the dead of winter. There was nothing else available in her price range, so she was forced to take on more jobs to make up the difference. Repealing the statewide pro prohibition on rent control would protect people like my friend and anyone in her situation by giving her the, demo them the democratic right to build a housing market that will actually meet the needs of our community. Thank you. Laura Olivas, followed by Kathleen Danister. Kathleen Danisur, followed by William Kelleher. William Kelleher, followed by Frederick Reed. Good evening, President Benton, members of the council. My name is Frederick Reed. I'm a lifelong resident of Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was born and raised here, educated in public school. I'm a graduate from UNM. I'm a developer. I, I'm a small developer. 80% of the multifamily properties owned in Albuquerque are owned by mom and pop operations like me. I'm also a licensed realtor, and I currently own market rate and affordable apartments. I urge you to vote no against this measure it will have devastating effects to small landlords like myself and my wife and, and a majority of people in this room tonight. We're not a titan development. We don't get money from the city. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm proud to say that we've got no public assistance in the affordable housing units that we've built. There is a solution for us to work together and not put a limit on rent increases. The solution is, possible solutions are low interest rates or or bond issues, which have been done by the city and the county to build affordable housing. Provide city-owned land. You heard the HomeWise people talk about city-owned property that could be converted to affordable housing. You, there's large lots in older neighborhoods that could have accessory residences built on there. The answer to this is not rent control. It's working with us 80% of small developers here in Albuquerque. Thank you. Patricia Pias, followed by Katie Curran. Hello, my name is Patricia Pies. I'm a lifelong resident of Albuquerque as well. I'm a proud Latina. And I am one of the landlords that uh, they're saying that I'm rich and got, have got so much money. But 
I've worked two jobs in my lifetime. I was a police officer for 20 years, and in the side, I bought rental property so I could try to better my family life because I was a, a victim of domestic violence, and I wanted to get out of that, and I, I was able to do that, and I'm proud of that. But passing this moratorium is going to kill my business. I, I can't afford to um, replace faucets and stoves and refrigerators if you're going to limit me to what I can charge for rent. I always try to keep my rents fair, and I, my, I consider my tenants part of my family, and I have have tenants that have been with me for almost 15 years. And so passing this is not going to solve the problem. The problem is we just don't have enough housing in, in Albuquerque. We, we need to come up with a solution that's going to benefit everybody. And, you know, I feel, I feel bad for, for these individuals. Been there. And we need to come up with some alternatives, and we need to work together. And working apart is just not working. And <coughs> We need to come up with something. Thank you. Katie Curran, followed by Greg Kaufman. Hi. My name's Katie Curran, and I feel really bad for all the people sleeping on the street tonight and all the people living in poverty in our city right now. People are really, really suffering in our city. Um, I'm an Albuquerque resident. I'm a local artist. I work in the public schools. I delivered food weekly to unsheltered people during the pandemic. I'm lucky enough to live in a little home my husband and I bought when we moved here 10 years ago when housing was affordable. I live in District 7. Thank you. I'm also a sober alcoholic. Um, after being in and out of jail in the hospital in my early 20s, I got sober when I was 24, and I don't think I would be alive or clean if I hadn't had access to rehab and affordable housing. Um, I'm speaking today in favor of the, of the, um, of regulating, of regulating rent in our state. This state is really, really suffering. The role of government is to ease suffering. That is your role. There's been talk of the market tonight. Your job as the government is to regulate the injustices brought on by the market. People unable to sleep, unable to have anywhere to live, that is an injustice of the market. It is your obligation you. your time has expired. Thank to you. regulate that, to mitigate the injustices of this economy. Greg Kaufman, followed by Catherine Huey. Catherine Huey, followed by Cody Leslie. Hi, my name is Catherine Huey, and I live in District 2. Um, and I wanted to talk about my experience as a tenant in Albuquerque. Um, Last year, I had my swamp cooler ripped out, and they left a hole for over nine months. Um, I had toilet water coming up my bathroom sink that made my apartment smell for over six months. And currently, I have a leak in the ceiling of my bathroom from my upstairs neighbor's bathroom into my bathroom. They still raise the rent, <laughs> and even though I asked if that was negotiable with everything I've had to deal with in my apartment. I was just hit with a hard no. I would love to have a responsible landlord, but that really just like has not been my experience um, living in Albuquerque, living in New Mexico. And I think it's because there's no regulation, there's nowhere you can go, and it's all owned by the same people. I looked at moving out. All of the properties were managed by the same property company. There's no competition, there's no market, and they're crowding out what could be a responsible landlord, somebody trying to build their wealth. They don't have access to this market. I really and truly think 
well-designed rent control can result in happy tenants and responsible landlords and good please vote yes Cody Leslie followed by Bianca and Saminas Mr. President and members of the council I am here today in support of affordable housing as many of my college peers are currently struggling to pay their rent many of them doubling or tripling on the advised occupancy just to afford their rent and I have to admit even though I am an acquisitions manager for a local single and multifamily investment company here in Albuquerque but the project the people's housing project the goal of their organization is dear to my heart yet I have faith that you as our trusted council members understand the difference between the goal of affordable housing and the economic impacts that come with uh, with ideas and policies such as rent control New York alone has accounted for over a thousand apartment buildings that have been abandoned by its owners since the, due to the inability to pay rent since rent control has been implemented now in New York there is an estimated four times the number of units that have been abandoned as there are homeless people in New York City. Moreover, rent control impacts in cities such as San Francisco and New York, and New York have shown that the average rent goes up five, over a five-year timeline, goes up in comparison to the surrounding areas. <clears throat> Doing what's truly best for the community and the people is one of the hardest of decisions, especially as a politician who has to understand that the people's interest has to be against their best choice at times. People do not understand that eventually rent control will have negative economic impacts on the community. Standing behind the tenants and the community is why you are our trusted council members. And I need affordable housing, including myself, I need to understand that you guys have to look out for our best interests now more than ever, which means voting against Memorial M225. Bianca Encinias, followed by Kara Grant. Kara Grant, followed by Halen Payasso. Hi, my name is Kara Grant, and I have been a property owner and investor in the Albuquerque area with my husband for over 20 years. But more importantly, I like to identify myself as a mother of four, grandmother of three, which I, I consider my most important job. My children are all renters, three in other states and one in New Mexico, and they have voiced concerns about the raise in rent. However, as I tell them, landlords are left with little choice in this matter. One factor is, there is that there has been a raise in federal and state minimum wage. Therefore, landlords, just like all other industries, have had to adjust. Without raising rent, landlords cannot provide their tenants with care for their properties as well as meet the other expenses to maintain their property. All of this is to say that I think it is an unfortunate situation that the rental rent industry has been a target to set up regulations for a situation that is far from a solution to this actual problem. In fact, this type of regulation is going to create more stress and problems rather than a solution. If this is implemented, you will find other investors with the funds to stimulate in, being <clears throat> in bringing more housing into our state or leave or go to other states to invest in. You will also potentially find more properties in the city not being adequately cared for. I urge you to vote no and support stimulating our economy, not handicapping it more with this kind of regulation. Kaylin Payasso, followed by Teresa Payne. Teresa Payne, followed by Evan Sanderson. Evan Sanderson, followed by Chuck Sheldon. President and council members, good evening. My name is Evan, I'm a local business owner, and I'm a small rental operator. I founded a company whose mission is to provide safe, affordable housing in our community. If you can bear with me with a mo for a moment while I uh, take a moment to break down actually what, um, uh, we're gonna break down 
how a dollar in rent is actually spent and where this money goes, okay? So we have here a $1 in rent. 14% goes to taxes to include our school, our boys in, in, in red here, the thin red stripe, the thin blue stripe, the guys in the back, our teachers, that's 14 cents. 16 cents goes to maintenance to include utilities and insurance. 12 cents goes to capital expenditures to include roof, HVAC, concrete, swamp coolers. 38 cents of this dollar goes to service the mortgage. We have debt on these properties. 38 cents of that dollar then goes to pay the mortgage. What we're left with is 10 cents of this dollar. And now this 10 cents is expected to sustain our companies and our business and our families to make ends meet. In order for us to execute our mission on providing safe and affordable housing, there has to be a margin, margin so that we can do so. Um, th this is why I'm in direct opposition to M22-5 and, uh, and um, advocate for a, a continuation of rent prohibition. Thank you. Chuck Sheldon, followed by Jacob Sherwood. Mr. President, Councilman, this council people. <laughs> My name is Chuck Sheldon. I'm President and CEO of PNC Management. We manage about 2,000 units, is that better, uh, here in Albuquerque, which represents about 205 owners, roughly 10, 10 units per owner. I'd like to dispel a couple of things. One, everybody looks at saying everybody's a, a greedy outside owner or, or an owner that just gouges. I grew up in tenement buildings in Los Angeles. And in so doing, I understood what it was to have no money in poverty. And I also understood what it was to have to work hard and go to school and change what I was doing. Over 90% of the people that own buildings here in Albuquerque are small mom and pops that work to make ends meet, put those properties together in order to be able to have some future that would take care of them. By capping rents, they cap their income. They cap their capacity to pay their bills. Expenses have gone up over 45% in the last two years. Utilities have gone up over 45% since 19. So we're seeing these expenses skyrocket. If we look at the utility costs for gas, gas is gonna go up three times. Thank you, sir. Jacob Sherwood, followed by Bex Hampton. Bex Hampton, followed by David Campbell. Good evening. If you are here in the crowd to support the memorial, please stand so the council can see our numbers. I was born and raised in New Mexico, and I'm currently a tenant in District 1. In the richest country in the world, no one should have to use a bathroom outside. In Albuquerque, we need to set the example by caring for our people and doing everything we can to provide affordable housing. Making rent, market rent is not affordable rent, meaning Albuquerque residents are being squeezed for every bit of money they have or going homeless. And if investors and developers don't wanna come to Albuquerque because rent control isn't illegal, that's not a problem. With all the cash Louie mentioned that we're being flushed with, we can build our own affordable housing to make up for any shortage or purchase and refurbish existing housing to be safe, clean, and dignified. We don't need to have the middleman. On Saturday, after doing nine hours of outreach, my 66-year-old neighbor came crying to me. Her landlord is doubling her rent and her disabled husband's rent from $800 to $1,600 because that's market rent. She can't afford it and is rapidly forced to move, struggling to find a place with less than one k in combined Social Security. Chuck Sheldon raised one of my friend's rents from $730 to over $1,300 over five years. People's lives are at stake. Do we only want to stimulate the economy for rich landlords and let Albuquerque residents go homeless? No. We want to keep everyone safe. We love the memorial exactly the way it is. Let's vote yes 
on ending the prohibition on rent control, yes for expanding democracy, and yes on this memorial. Thank you, everyone. David Campbell, followed by Brianna Connor. Good evening. I'm David Campbell. I'm the CEO of Mesa del Sol, a master plan community here in Albuquerque in District 6. I am currently, we are currently building 314 units of workforce housing in Mesa del Sol. If we put our thumb on the scale between landlords and tenant, as this bill would do, those apartments will go away. That will not continue to be a viable project. Um, I have hundreds of acres available for affordable housing uh, and housing of all income levels, ages, and demographics available in the city of Albuquerque to, to be developed. There are outstanding federal, state, and local programs that encourage and incentivize affordable housing, the construction of affordable housing. So there's not nothing that can be done. There is a great deal that can be done. Let me give you one example. And that is, in order to qualify to construct those affordable housing uh, developments in my area, I need to have a bus line. I need to have University Boulevard have a bus line that runs a regular route to Mesa del Sol so that people who live there can afford to get to work and, and home and jobs and, and uh, school and so on. So that's just one item that if the council, and I know you do, want to do something, we'll be back to talk to you about the kind of municipal functions that are required to encourage and incentivize affordable housing. Thank you very much. Brianna Connor, followed by Jim Wibble. Hello, council members. My name is Brianna, Brianna Connor. I'm a tenant in District 6. And I would like to humbly request the council vote to pass council bill M225. My partner and I are currently being evicted because our out-of-state landlord is selling our home. This has had a huge impact on our life. We have just a few weeks to research affordable housing options called listings, see spaces, and hopefully be approved for a new apartment, a process that is increasingly competitive, fast-moving, and cutthroat. Many places require tenants make three times the rental price. Minimum wage is eleven fifty dollars in Albuquerque. Working full-time, that means you can afford and verify your income for a $500 apartment. In the weeks that I have been searching, I have never seen a $500 apartment in my neighborhood. I am able to navigate this process and am grateful for the community I have to support us through our housing crisis and in the incredible stress it has created. But that's not the case for so many of our community members. When you vote yes to pass this council bill, you will be supporting our elders, our youth, our families. Rent control is vital. Keep New Mexicans in their homes. Vote for people, not profits. Please vote to pass Council Bill M-225. Jim Wibble, followed by Angelina Crowley. President, ben President Benton, councilors, Thanks for your time today. Uh, my name is Jim Weibel. I'm a commercial real estate broker here in Albuquerque. Um, I also own rental property, just for the record. <laughs> uh, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the supply issue. We have, um, I'm here on behalf of Kirtland Partnership Committee, where I volunteer as one of the board members. We have a great economic engine in Kirtland Air Force Base uh, that is doing marvelous things for Albuquerque in the, in the amount of economic benefit that we get from the military mission here. Um, they have a housing supply problem just like the rest of the city does. I think it's important to realize that it's really a supply problem here. There are uh, missions that are going on at Kirtland Air Force Base that are being delayed because they can't bring additional people into our community. And so that's delaying the economic benefit to our community by not having that housing available. Um, Mesa del Sol is a great solution. Uh, we do need all of the above in terms of increasing the housing supply in our community. There is, you know, the beginning airman to senior leaders in the Air Force that are trying to get here, along with Sandia National Labs, who is going to hire some 3,500 people in the next year. So I encourage you to not to support this memorial and allow us to get better housing supply in Albuquerque. Thank you. Angelina Crowley, followed by Craig Boney. Angelina joining on Zoom. Had a long day at work.
Craig Boney, followed by Tad Lemitsky. President Benton, uh, council members, uh, want to uh, take a moment to urge you to vote no on this. Uh, I'm a small uh, property owner. I have 16 units in uh, council member Davis's district, and um, I've had it for about 30 years. I'm uh, a retiree from Sandia, uh, bought this property to uh, supplement uh, Social Security when I retired. Um, I, I am not getting rich off of this uh, endeavor, and uh, I spend a lot of my own time over there I, um, you know, having to fix things up, and I do um, have to refurbish the property. It's uh, uh, almost a 50-year-old property now, uh, so it does have uh, you know, new cabinets and, and new appliances and, and things that I have to put in there. And... Um, do, having a rent control uh, would very much uh, make uh, having the uh, capital to do those kinds of things um, much more difficult. Um, for example, I've, I've cabinets have gone up uh, three times uh, just in the last few years, uh, if you can even get them. Uh, same thing with uh, uh, when I replace an air conditioner. Uh, it's gone from seven thousand dollars to eighty five hundred dollars now. So, it's um, <laughs> anyway. It's very very difficult to f afford those kinds of things if if uh, there's rent control. Tad Niminski, followed by Dr. Nadia Marsh. Well, I am surprised. They didn't want to sign it me until I went, I guess, to my AG office. I guess that works. That's minimum. So anyway, here is the issue. Buying and selling property. That's what city council doing. For example, buying for high price. Selling for bargain. There is why they in zoning and planning committee. Well, that's where the money been, especially old timers, Benton, through the Jones and other. Well, Sally Ruiz family, free market, all free market by Clarissa Pena. That's one example. Anyway, let me brush it a little bit. Developers. Who are these developers that what we've been talking? Are they not non profit? No, they are all for profit. They that's some developers is still doing businesses with this council. Way from New York. Yes, Casa Feliz, owner, developer. Now, other developer with this, Isaac Benton is, is associated. Thank you. Dr. Nadia Marsh, followed by Zachary Rivas. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Nadia Marsh, and I live in District 6. And um, I'm a physician at UNM. And I just want to emphasize the fact that housing is health care. Without a place to live, we don't have our health. And I can speak as a physician that many of my patients are homeless. And without a home, they are sick and they are dying. And I am not exaggerating. They are dying every day. Their diabetes is uncontrolled, their hypertension, their substance abuse. It doesn't matter what I do because at, at the end of the day, they're leaving that clinic 
and their priority is surviving. There's no place to heal, there's no place to hide, there's no place to store your medications if you're homeless. How can we separate the right to, uh, to a home from health? It's the same thing. And this is called the social determinants of health. And as a civilized society, what's most important is the right to live, the right to exist. And I hear people here talking about how they can't afford, based on their pensions or Social Security, not to have that renter. Well, then we should be fighting for Social Security, better benefits. Thank you, your time is up. And we should be fighting for a pension, but not relying on renters, poor renters, to make up what we don't have. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Zachary Rivas, followed by Alicia Sullivan. Alicia Sullivan, followed by Mark Rickert. Can you hear me? So I'm going to make it quick. I was home when this came to my attention. I um, am everything. I have a husband who died on the street homeless. I have a son who's a drug addict. I own a management company. Um, I think I want them to come to my office and go through my files to see that my owners aren't these money-hungry people. After 30 some years, you can have your meeting at my office next time. I was a little shocked to walk in. It almost made me want to cry when I saw them because I have wonderful owners. Some of these people are, have been my owners. Um, but I feel like you guys make decisions and then I pay for it. You made a Section 8. Everyone had to take Section 8. Didn't think that through because I get to, or housing vouchers that we had to take, housing vouchers. That has affected my company profusely. I'm trying to help tenants. I'm trying to help housing. It took them 47 days. My owner has a mortgage. My owner can't fix my tenant stuff because he didn't get money for 47 days. So I'm incredibly frustrated by it all. I asked quickly on what I thought I wanted to say other than make your decisions wisely. I'm so sad that it's the difference between here and here. It's not that. You can give a homeless a homeless person, but if he doesn't take his medicine, he's not going to go home. So I apologize for me being nervous. Just please make your decisions wisely. It will affect everyone. Mark Rickert, followed by Jason Santos. Good evening, Mr. President. Council members, my name is Mark Rickert. I'm a United States Navy veteran. Grew up with a single mother who beat, was beaten along with us regularly. We lived housing and security. I have 21 plus years of one day at a time sobriety. I'm a real estate broker and our team helps first time home buyers achieve home ownership. I'm also a property owner and small multifamily developer. Asar Lindbeck, a Swedish economist who chaired the Nobel P Prize Committee for many years, once reportedly declared that rent control is the best way to destroy a city other than bombing. Most property owners I know, including myself, are caring, hardworking people. They care about their tenants and business survival. The majority of property owners I know are not from out of state or trying to gentrify our beautiful Albuquerque. We provide safe housing and work very hard to provide our community and tenants. Rent control will force people like me to really consider if I want to continue providing housing in this city or possibly this state. I've already moved away from the San Francisco Bay Area due to these types of intrusions on our lives and businesses. Um, do, just ask yourself, do I want Albuquerque to thrive or do I, and do I think rent control is the answer? Are there other creative ways? There are. I urge you just to vote no to rent control. Thank you very much. Jason Santos, 
followed by Amanda Velarde. Good afternoon, uh, city council members. I'm a volunteer with the People's Housing Project, and I wanted to speak to some of the opposition towards rent, con rent control here. Uh, opponents of the measure will often cite studies that warn of an overall decrease in housing supply due to a lack of incentives for landlords you know, to, to invest. Uh, and while the studies have shown that, uh, we can offset this by investing more in public housing funded by the city council and you know, the state itself. Uh, we do not need to rely on the landlords building properties. We can do it ourselves, we can take care of it, and we can cut them out the picture. Uh, many of them have talked about the difficulty that comes with being a small landlord, and uh, you know we understand that. It is hard to live off of someone else's income. It's not easy, especially when these people are already not making much money. And so these concerns are valid and they are real, but we have to put the tenants first before these landlords. More than ever, tenants need security, and by implementing rent control, we can make sure that people feel more safe and secure in their housing. Uh, specifically, in District 9, I've spoken to many residents who tell me that they don't know how much longer they have at their house because with the increases in rent, they can't keep affording to, to live there. Council members, the choice is simple. Stand with the interests of the working class citizens here in New Mexico or protect the wealth of small and large landlords all alike. So uh, please uh, pass the memorial. Thank you. Amanda Velarde, followed by Roger Culp on Zoom. Good evening, President, Council members. My name is Amanda Velarde. I wear multiple hats. I'm a commercial broker and I'm a, I'm a property owner and I've been in property management for many years. And we can all agree we're in a housing crisis. But I think if we look at three things, um, the housing crisis is not caused by the cost of rents, but it's caused by the growth. Over the last 10 years, we had very little housing um, built in our marketplace after the Great Recession. Our housing permits for single family dropped significantly, as well as our multifamily housing permits. And so I'm very excited that this is caused by growth in our market, and I'm excited on where our market's headed. So the housing crisis, if you look at what's been typically built over the last 12, 20 years, I'm coming in and out. You look at what was built along Montgomery in 1980s, we had a big portion of multifamily built. In early 2000s, around Cottonwood, we had a lot of multifamily. And then from 2000 to 2019, we had very little construction in our marketplace. So we're seeing a lot of mixed use, um, affordable, multi-housing, um, single family just start taking off again. So it's a lack of supply. So we need more housing projects and it includes market rate, affordable and low income housing units. So we can accommodate all of the New Mexicans in our marketplace at all wages, our teachers, our police officers, our firemen. And so I'd ask for you to vote no um, for rent control. Thank, Thank you. you. Roger Culp, followed by Celeste Romero. Hello, my, I live in District 6, and I've been working for, with the People's Housing Project. I am disabled, and I urge all members of the City Council to vote yes on Council Bill M265. Rising rents are particularly hard on people with disabilities and fixed incomes. Many people with disabilities only have SSI or SSDI as their only source of income. For those on SSI, this is usually about $800 a month. 800 SSDI usually pays less. Rare, sometimes, if you're lucky, this is supplemented by SNAP benefits, which might add additional $100. In Albuquerque, the so-called mar fair market rent is $942 for a one-bedroom, but the average rent is about $1,300. Both exceed the typical SSI and SSDI benefits. It is clear that people with disabilities and fixed incomes are driven more and more into homelessness. Many people with disabilities were hit very hard by the COVID pandemic. Add to that the ever increasing amount of rents in Albuquerque that forced many disabled people into homelessness. 
Most homeless shelters are not accessible to people with disabilities, putting more and more disabled people under the street. Housing is extremely difficult for, if not impossible, to obtain. Stand with disabled residents and vote yes to democracy for disabled people on fixed income. Help end the prohibition on residence control. We should have the right to enact rent control if we need it. Thank, Thank you. you. Your time is up. Celeste Romero, followed by Lorenzo Gomez. Lorenzo Gomez, followed by Rhiannon Samuel. Rhiannon Samuel, followed by Matthew Nawakowski. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the council. My name is Rhiannon Samuel, representing NAOP. I've already stated our opposition to this memorial earlier in the month when it was introduced, but I want to underscore the reality of rent control's impact on our community. To put it plainly, this is a Band-Aid for something that really only has one solution increasing the supply of all housing. As you heard from the Mortgage Finance Authority presentation two weeks ago, because this is a simple supply and demand issue, again, the solution to our affordability issue is to build. With just the introduction of this memorial, I have been told by our members that potential investors have already been spooked out of doing business in our city. This is not something our community can afford. Now is the time that we should be encouraging outside investment, growing our economy, and adding to our housing inventory. Should this memorial pass at the local level, then move to the state legislature for consideration, development would stop. By now, the article by in the Wall Street Journal has most likely been shared with you from my colleagues. It is undeniable proof that once rent control is introduced, development shutters as evidenced in their steep decline in building permits. I know that we can all work together on alternative solutions to encourage development of more housing. In fact, we have already made excellent headway with the planning department this past year to improve inefficiencies. Let's keep up that momentum and not be sidetracked by short-sighted answers Thank to you. our Thank housing you. challenges. <clears throat> Matthew Nowakowski. I'm so sorry, Lorenzo is ready. He was having tech issues. Um, Mr. Gomez, please. Matthew Nowakowski, followed by Patrick Gallegos. Hi, I'm Matt Nowakowski. Uh, I'm a owner of a small uh, fourplex of two bedroom apartments in downtown Albuquerque. Um, I've owned since 2007 and starting back then my rent was were at $600 and today the rents are $800. Uh, that is a 2% increase, an inflationary increase in my rents for this time. I haven't seen any of the large rents that would need any kind of rent control. The other thing is that anytime I have a, a tenant that needs to leave, a good lever for a small owner like me is to raise the rent to encourage them to choose to leave. If I terminate the lease, uh, you know, at the end of the lease, I typically tend to take two to $3,000 to have to fix up my apartments from the damage that the tenant leaves. Whereas when the tenant leaves, I typically only suffer half a month's rent lost. I don't see a need for any kind of rent control, especially on small landowners. Thank you very much. Patrick Gallegos, followed by Lorenzo Gomez. Hello, my name is Patrick Gallegos. I'm a, uh, a tenant and a renter in District 7. 
Um, affordable housing has become more and more rare for working class, class people in this city. As rents continue to climb and wages stay stagnant, the struggle to maintain a quality standard of living has become increasingly apparent. Um, even with the job I work now, which compensates better than most, I found it more difficult every month to pay for um, rent, utilities, medical bills, insurance bills, phone bills, and all essential food and hyg hygienic items without feeling suffocated under the con constant pressure of skyrocketing rents and inflation. And the prohibition on rent control to ensure that we can take the first steps to ensure a safe and affordable uh, future for all Albuquerque citizens. Um, increasing the supply of housing does not um, increase the affordability of housing and is just one uh, lie of unending economic growth that does not exist in this kind of market where just because we have perpetual growth, this idea of perpetual growth that does not affect the struggles that low income working class people are facing and landlords should not exist in this kind of uh, system where only one particular group are being um, forced out of their homes and displaced. Thank you. Lorenzo Gomez, followed by Cheryl Gibson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, okay, good. My name is Lorenzo Gomez and I organize a housing project. I'm here today to strongly urge city council to vote yes on Memorial and to push the state legislature to repeal the prohibition on rent control. Um, the prohibition is only hurting working class people in Albuquerque uh, with ridiculous rent prices while benefiting business and corporate interests, which we have heard plenty of um, perspective from business interests tonight, certainly. Uh, we should be putting people over profits, and that's, that's what we should be doing, not the other way around. The city council's job is to look out and work for the people in Albu of Albuquerque, and this is a popular policy that would greatly benefit a high number of New Mexicans as well as citizens of Albuquerque. Um, and it would also directly show that the council is actually working to help the people that um, they're supposed to work for. Whatever systems of government bureaucracy that get in the way of ending the prohibition on rent control are very much uh, worth working through. Housing is a, is a basic human right and we should work our best towards housing and helping working class people in New Mexico. Overwhelmingly, housing insecurity targets people of color, indigenous people and LGBTQ plus people. Voting yes on this memorial is a huge step in repairing these inequities. Uh, you should all vote yes on the memorial, which helps, which would work to enable democratic decision making on the prohibition of rent control, as it should be. This may not guarantee that we see the prohibition of rent control repealed, but it is a good step in the right direction to help working class Albuquerque citizens, not business and corporate interests, as we have heard plenty from tonight. Thank you. Cheryl Gibson, followed by Mia August. <laughs> Hello, my name is Cheryl and I live in District 7. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I am here to speak in support of the memorial to release the prohibition on rent control, M225. According to Law Insider, quote, essential commodities means those items, the availability of which is considered vital for domestic use or consumption. That's an essential commodity, okay? I think it's generally understood that housing is vital to live and work and function in our society. Other vital commodities include water, fuel, light, power, and food. It seems that many vital commodities need to, need to have and do operate under certain regulations. There need to be methods to deter predatory practices and yet allow for successful operation and function of business. I think we should release the prohibition on rent control so that we can look at solutions to the imbalance that exists. Remembering it, this memorial does not impose rent control, it simply allows for discussion. Thank you for your time. Mia Augustin, Augustin, followed by Aguiola Pesco. Celeste Romero was online having technical difficulties. She's ready for my understanding. Good evening, City Council, and good evening to my district councilor, Trudy Jones. 
As Americans, we don't like the thought that bad things can happen to good people, but they do. Many people are homeless for reasons that have nothing to do with responsibility or bad life choices or character deficits. I recognize that realtors and landlords are experiencing cost increases, but so do we. I acknowledge that they are having to make hard choices, but so do we. My own hard choices included getting rid of our car, emptying our savings, canceling our anniversary plans, and so much more, all to make rent. Now, we're losing the apartment anyway. In what way is any of this reasonable? Yes, there is new construction happening, but it will, by and large, not be aimed at my demographic. Yes, solutions are being sought, but advocates for the homeless are not invited to that table. Human needs are human rights, and supply-side economics has been failing to meet human needs since the Reagan administration. There is no why rent increases should exceed the rate of increase in, <laughs> increase in the general cost of living. Although this resolution binds no one to actually do anything, it does show political courage. Other cities are waiting for someone to take the vanguard. That can be Albuquerque. Thank you. Aguiola Bezco, followed by Celeste Romero. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Aguiola Bezco. I bought my first house by waiting tables at two restaurants and living in a 300 square foot apartment. Home ownership fundamentally changed my life for the better. As a single person, an immigrant, a blue collar worker, and a woman becoming a homeowner allowed me to belong and officially become a New Mexican. I have one rental unit in Albuquerque next to my house. My tenants are also my neighbors. Rent control would prohibit me from taking care of my property, will negatively impact my relationship with my tenants. Rent control will cause property conditions to deteriorate, values to go down, followed by many other negative impacts. I hear both sides here today and feel for both, but we need to treat the symptom and not we need to treat the cause and not the symptom, right, as we're talking about this. Unfortunately, rent control will backfire on the very people that want it in place. Rent control is not the answer. Only more units will bring equilibrium to the supply and demand, allowing for the rental market to naturally stabilize. Thank you. Celeste Romero, followed by Serge Martinez. Hello, I am a resident of District 1, and I'm asking the council to vote yes on the memorial urging the New Mexico State Legislature to end the prohibition on rent control. Albuquerque tenants have been struggling due to rent hikes. Many fear being pushed into homelessness or already have, including elderly people on Social Security. Since March 2020, rent has gone up by 40% in Albuquerque. The 30-year prohibition on rent control prevents our communities from democratically dealing with our housing crisis. Ending the prohibition won't immediately enact rent control, but it will expand our communities' options to democratically deal with our housing crisis. We know that as the city council, you guys care about Albuquerque residents, including the 40% of, of us who are tenants. So I hope that you vote yes on this memorial to show that support. Thank you. Serge Martinez, followed by Mark Bentz. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Serge Martinez. I'm on the faculty at University of New Mexico School of Law, where I teach, write, and practice in the area of landlord-tenant law and policy. And I'm the president of a small nonprofit focused on housing stability called Amparo. I'm here tonight only in my personal capacity to support this memorial. Um, you've heard a lot of talk about the um, alleged horrors of rent control, but you've also heard a lot about the need for innovative and creative solutions to the housing crisis. And one of the most important things to know about this memorial is that it's asking Santa Fe to keep its hands off of Albuquerque's ability to respond to its own housing needs, carefully, creatively, and innovatively. 
As you know, Albuquerque is a home rule jurisdiction. That means that we choose to have the maximum ability to govern our own affairs and filed a charter saying that. That means that Albuquerque has the power to take care of things that are purely local without interference from Santa Fe. It's hard to think of anything more local than housing. And this council is charged with finding solutions to exactly the sort of problem it's facing now. Santa Fe passed a bill in 1992 with the express intent of taking some of that power away from Albuquerque. Anyone who thinks that Albuquerque should be able to handle this very local crisis with a local response that is not influenced by Santa Fe or anyone else should support this memorial. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric and misconception around uh, some sort of monolithic boogeyman that folks are calling rent control. Um, and I'll be happy to come back and talk to you about what rent control really is. Thank you, really your time is up. And how it can be part of a good strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Bentz, followed by Brett Locke. Please unmute. You're muted, Mr. Benz. There we go. Hello. Um, I've heard both sides. I uh, am much appreciative. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, it does sound like we do need quite a bit more housing. I have uh, just under 70 units in the uptown area. And I've been a landlord for 30 years, and I am not rich. Uh, I can tell you that that 10 cents on the dollar is what I see. So we lost him. Greg Steyer, followed by Jody Lopez Peacock. Greg Steyer. Oh, Mr. Locke, please proceed. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm here opposing this memorial. In 2020, I purchased three fourplexes in the vicinity of Central and Wyoming, so you know the neighborhood. I spent the majority of my life savings on them. I uh, depend on them for income as a retiree. I don't have a pension income um, other than social security. This is my future, which is so true for so many of us. When I purchased the units, they were in terrible condition. Um, I replaced leaky roofs, non-functioning swamp coolers, non-operable windows. I repaired cabinets falling off the walls. I uh, invested over $100,000 after I purchased them just to make them livable for my tenants. Average rents are around $740 a month as of October 1. Um, one of my fourplexes hasn't made me so much as a nickel in two years. My biggest issue is uh, non-paying tenants. In my three years of ownership, I've had to do seven evictions. Tenants don't give 30 days notice. They just stop paying. By the time they, they, uh, I finally get them out. I've typically lost three to four months rent and spent an average of fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars to repair. Uh, my property and manager and I do everything we can to give people financial assistance. Um, Thank you. Your time is up. I do oppose this memorial. Thank you, Greg Steyer. Followed by Jody Lopez Peacock. My name is Greg Steer. I didn't have time to practice and time it. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, I've been a resident of Albuquerque for the past 10 years or so, both as a landlord and a tenant. So I know how difficult it is to write that ch monthly check to the landlord. But why single them out? Prices have jumped in virtually every area of the economy in the past year and a half. Food, energy, cost of materials, the cost of repairs, wages for employees. 
And who's going to build all these houses that we need? Who's going to refurbish all these older buildings? Not the city. How do you think you're going to attract developers by limiting how much they can earn? What other professions are you going to impose a salary cap on? Lawyers? Doctors? I guess the point is, what is the logic of punishing those who can best able provide to provide solutions and not just band-aids for this problem? The fact is that rent control is banned by 75% of the states in this country, with good reason. Look how well it's worked in LA, San Francisco, New York City. These are places with the highest homeless population Thank you. Your time is country. up. Jody Lopez Peacock, we have uh, you as an attendee. I've promoted you to panelist. Angelina Crowley. Hi, um, I'm a member of the People's Housing Project along with the Southwest Carpenters Union. Um, so it's interesting uh, the TMC uh, owner spoke because I've seen a lot of apartments in my district, District 6, that TMC owns that are in complete slum conditions. Uh, there's one near Union Central, um, and it's a mostly condemned building that people still live in. Um, AC units ripped out totally disgusting, infested with roaches, and they're charging over $1,000 for rent. And there's a homeless encampment there too. It's disgusting and dangerous and falling apart like many of their complexes that they crop the mostly low income and fixed income people in my district into. So that's hilarious. Um, yeah. So why should the property manager at this complex be allowed to unjustifiably increase rent as much as they want while their residents see no improvement. And um, there is a lot of small landlords talking tonight um, who say they do have justifiable reasons to raise the rent. Great, then you shouldn't be worried if your reasons are justifiable, but rent control, uh, it gives that community an answer and stuff like that. And it doesn't allow the landlords to raise the rent unjustifiably at like, and allow people to be at the mercy of their landlords, especially people in low income, fixed income. And we have a shortage of affordable housing. It's not a simple supply and demand issue. It's about power and the power that tenants don't Thank have. Thank you, your time is up. Jody Mr. is on Zoom now, if she can get her comment in. Jody, can you accept my invitation to become panelist? We're going to have to proceed with the meeting at this point. Unless there was Go ahead, Ms. Peacock. Waiting. That's good. I'm gonna. That's gonna conclude our public comment at this point. We've uh, heard from a lot of folks, and um, we're gonna move on then to the uh, to the bill, and uh, we'll start with the sponsor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have heard so much misinformation tonight, so I'm just gonna spend a few minutes um, talking about what this bill actually does, and it's really not a bill; it's a memorial. So it doesn't do anything in terms of actually creating rent control. I do think, and I'm an economist, I do understand how markets work, but I think it's important that we think through what rent control means. Under the state statute, we can do nothing about rent control or rent stabilization, which is really, I think, what we're talking about here. I haven't heard anyone come to me and say, we want old school rent control, like it's 1972 in New York City. Um, 
or like St. Paul just did, which is a 3% cap on all rents for everyone, which is pretty extreme. And again, I haven't heard anyone saying that that's what they want. What I'm hearing and what I believe is that we have a crisis in our city that is a shortage of housing. And yes, I think we all agree that we need more housing. Building more housing takes a couple of years. People right now are being priced out of their units today. Today, people are looking at increases that are coming on. I've got, um, got Charlie who has over 30% increase in the last two years. I have Mark, who had an 18% increase last year. I had Lisa, who had a 20% increase last year. Just as, just as an aside, Charlie has also had his fees go up 28.5%. So these are pro people that are being priced out of housing today. And so while I think we all agree that we need more housing in the short term, we need a whole lot more than just plans to build more housing. We need actual work to help these folks remain housed because once someone goes unhoused, it is really, really difficult for them to come back. And I don't think anyone here wants more people in our community experiencing homelessness. So again, I personally would have liked for this proposal to pass city council tonight. I would like to see the rent control moratorium at the state lifted. And then I would like to see an actual conversation in this body about what can be done. One of the ideas that I think is really important is rent stabilization for our most disadvantaged neighbors. Perhaps just for affordable housing. Perhaps just for people who are being priced out right now, today. And that could be coupled with some financial incentives to help those landlords that are impacted by that small group of people. I would also say that we have this new goal of you know, 5,000 new units that was um, announced today by President Benton and Mayor Keller. And you know, when we reach that, I think it's a time to revisit any kind of rent stabilization policy we have. But again, today, People are being priced out of housing, which is an essential human right. And I think that everyone here tonight has agreed that that is important. So um, I just wanted to clarify what this actually was. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions from anybody, Mr. President. Councilor Lewis. Thank you, Mr. President. Certain, certainly a lot of misinformation about this. Um, and number one, I think first and foremost that this is a this is a memorial. I think it's been called a, um, it's been said that this is not going to impose uh, any kind of rent control um, and that uh, it's only for discussion. Uh, but I, make no mistake, I mean, this is, a, this is a policy statement by the governing body of the city of Albuquerque. A policy statement that even, even with us just discussing this tonight, the conversations we've had about it, that it actually might be a serious memorial. Um, I believe that it has harmed investment in this city because we know that what is truly going to help lift people out of poverty, help provide more affordable housing, increase housing starts, is when, is when people make, they, they take their hard-earned money, uh, their, their personal capital and their reputation, and they invest in our city. And so this is absolutely detrimental uh, to our ability to be able to do that. And we see examples of it um, all, over our, all, over the, all over the country, but it, it's hurting us already. And I do believe there's good intentions, and, and, and good intentions that are designed to help, uh, this in particular is, uh, actually does the opposite. It hurts more than it's going to help. Uh, and I do believe it's going to hurt some of the most vulnerable renters in our city. Um, there has been some great suggestions on what we do. So if our desire is more, and we've said that our desire is more housing, more affordable housing, um, uh, we all agree that uh, we want to make those opportunities available, and there's been some great proposals. There's been, we've had some great presentations over the last few weeks. Uh, we've talked about speeding up inspections and approvals. 
um, incentivizing investment in our city. And again, it was said that uh, some of the administration um, proposals that came out today were uh, would actually help. I mean, there are actually some good steps in that direction. Uh, but we also, you know, I, I do think we have to be honest about other states and, and what other cities have done, uh, whether it be St. Paul. Uh, and we have to seriously look at those those facts, and we have to um, we have to seriously consider that. We think of L.A. County, who uh, uh, put rent control in 2018. Um, there's been a lot of talk about homelessness, and um, in this in this same conversation, we talk about homelessness, and yet in L.A. County. Uh, there was growth, uh, 20,000 more people that were homeless in L.A. County since 2018, since they implemented rent control, the, the absolute, the highest in America. And so we can't ignore those facts, and I, and I certainly believe there's been a lot of misinformation. I think the intentions are good, uh, but extremely misguided. And so I'll be voting no on this. All right, any other comments or questions, Councilors? Uh, Councilor Fabelgo. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to close, so if there was any other questions before that. Okay, Fine. all right. Um, so I just want to say, I think um, it's impressive how many people showed up tonight, and I think that no matter how this vote goes, the People's Housing Project has won, because they wanted us to acknowledge that there is a housing crisis in Albuquerque, and I think that we heard that from every single person who spoke tonight. Earlier today, the mayor, President Benton, um, released, had a press conference where they talked about in a complete suite of new proposals to help people make sure that we have enough affordable housing, make sure we can keep people housed, make sure we can stop some of the predatory practices um, that are happening in our community against renters. And so I fully expect that every single person that took the time to speak tonight and acknowledge that crisis will be supportive of that entire suite. So in that way, congratulations to these young people. You've done a great job, and you really have brought an issue forward that's important and should have been discussed, and I'm proud to have kind of facilitated that discussion. I'm going to close with not my words, but words that all of the counselors got from Talia Friedman, who is a, and I will quote from her, she is a concerned citizen, a real estate professional, and an investment owner. She did give me her permission to use her name. <laughs> um, and this is what she wrote to all of the counselors. The solution to the housing crisis happening all over the country should be a multi-pronged approach. We all agree one primary solution is more housing, whether built by the government, private investors, or both. And while more inventory is crucial to a long-term solution, there are immediate measures that must be taken to keep people from ending up on the streets. We cannot solely focus on the long term. Prioritizing the concerns of investors while allowing people to literally become homeless. It is unconscionable to think the former is more important than the latter. And voting against this memorial would tell your constituents that is who you favor. Urge your support. Mr. President, Mr. President, just a question before we close. A question? Mr. Yeah, Mr. President, I, I just wanted to know, uh, the administration hasn't weighed in on this, I don't believe, at least tonight. Uh, would, would you say whether the administration is for or against this memorial? Uh, Mr. President and Councillor Lewis, I think, uh, we have uh, Director uh, Pierce uh, in audience, and I would like her to comment if she's around. I don't understand. Who's going to comment? What does the mayor's office say? You for it or against it? I believe she's on Zoom. Oh, this is a policy statement of the city of Albuquerque, and so I'm interested to know if the administration of the city of Albuquerque is for this or not. I, I don't see the director here. She is on Zoom and ready to speak, sir. Oh, she is on Zoom? Yes, sir. Okay, please. Let's hear from her. Um, 
good evening, Councillor Benton. Didn't have time to run down with that, but thank you, um, Councillor Benton, Councillor Lewis. Um, overall, the city is supportive of the need to have more affordable housing. We know, as we've heard tonight and we've discussed in the past, we do need more affordable housing options in our community. And this is one way to achieve that through this bill. I, I think that was affirmative that the mayor is saying that support. The good thing is that the mayor can't veto this, so we'll go ahead and vote. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to a vote. It's been uh, moved and seconded and uh, closed. So we will go to a roll call vote. Councilor Basson. No. Councilor Davis. No. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. No. Councilor Jones. No. Councilor Lewis. No. Councilor Pena. Councilor Sanchez. No. Councilor Benton. Yes. That fails. A two seven vote. Uh, the council will take a dinner break.
All right, we're back in session. <clears throat> we are on general public comments. And I think we have a few people signed up who did not speak on M5, so we'll hear from them. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Kristen Forge. Kristen? Okay, next up is Christy Frogner Chewy. Christy in the room. Don't see her. Lead us to Zoom, and uh, the person is not an attendee. So that's okay. it. Nobody else is no, on sir. Zoom. Okay, so that concludes that portion of the meeting. We'll go to. Questions and answers for the administration. Counselors, any questions or for the administration? Uh, I I did send a few, and there it sounds like we're kind of in the in the midst of uh, getting answers to them. Um, I don't believe we have we we kind of uh, released our friends from economic development. That was one of the questions. So uh, we'll move on past that. If there are no other uh, questions from counselors. And we will go to the journal. Vice President Lewis. Mr. President, I move approval of the journal. Second. There's a motion second. and a second. And Ms. Hinojos will go to the vote. Roll call. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Lewis? Yes. Councillor Pena? Excused? Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. That passes unanimously. All right. <clears throat> we are now communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Councillor Sanchez? Thank you, Mr. President. I make a motion to pull 043 out of Public Safety Committee and place it on the November 7th Council Agenda for Action. 043 is adopting a new article in Chapter 9 of the Revised Ordinance of Albuquerque 1994 Health, Safety, and Sanitation to be known as, El as the Safe Outdoor Space Operators Permit, establishing a permit and a permitting fee. Second. There's a motion and a second. We'll go to the vote. Councillor Brisson. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. It passes unanimously. All right, then we have Councillor Sanchez with another change. Thank you, Mr. President. I make a motion to amend the letter of introduction to place M266 on the November 7th Council agenda instead of referring to it Public Safety Committee. M6 is asking the New Mexico legislature to reinstate qualified immunity. Second. And there's a second. And we'll go to the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. And we will go to. Uh, Councillors Davis and Feeblecorn and myself, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing M7 and placing it on the November 7th Council Agenda for Action. M7 is the City of Albuquerque City Council urges the first session of the 56th Legislature to adopt legislation providing for the creation of regional housing authorities that are independent government units. Second. And, um, there's a motion and a second, and counselors, uh, I think, uh, 
where we've got this, uh, we did distribute this anyway, um, and uh, we're having discussions, and this is just setting the stage for continuing discussions about a true regional housing authority, which we've really never had. We've had, we have a, a city housing authority, we have a county housing authority. They both do great work with what they have, uh, but they have very limited authority, and uh, this might be a way to, uh, to build our capacity. That's the intention anyway. So, uh, this would, this is a, a late introduction, so uh, this will be a suspension of the rules requiring a two-thirds vote. Ms. Hinojos. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. All right, and then we'll move to uh, an additional one. This is uh, Councilors Feeblecorn, Grout, Jones, and Pena. Uh, Mr. President, um, I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing O49 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. O49 is establishing the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Commission, establishing the responsibilities of the commission. And this is co-sponsorship with Councilors Grout, Jones, and Pena. And there's a second from Councilor Grout. And again, this is a rule suspension requiring a two-thirds vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. <clears throat> Vice President Lewis. Mr. President, I'm going to approve over the letter of introduction. Second. And a second from Councilor Jones. Thank you. We'll go to the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. All right. Thanks. Councilors, <laughs> we'll move to the consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would like to uh, point out that for the individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on a board or a commission, thank you for your willingness to serve uh, the city and your community. Vice President Lewis. Move approval of the consent agenda. There's a second from Councillor Jones, we'll go to the vote on the consent agenda. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll go to announcements. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a meeting of the Finance and Government Operations Committee on Monday, October 24th at 5 p.m. in our council committee room on the ninth floor. Thank you. We do have a public hearing tonight. This is AC 2210, the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association appeals the zoning hearing examiner's decision to approve a permit for a wall permit, major, a wall permit major version for a courtyard wall for lot 20 block 14 Broadmoor edition located at 4200 Brockmont Avenue Northeast zone R1B and Ms. Culloden will explain this appeal. Thank you Mr. President and counselors. The issue in this appeal is whether a wall permit major should be approved for a six foot tall courtyard wall. The zoning hearing examiner approved the wall and the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association has appealed, arguing that the homeowner applicant has not satisfied two of the IDO criteria 
or taller front yard walls. Um, specifically, I'll refer to these as the 20% rule and the window rule. The council referred this appeal to its land use hearing officer who recommends that the council deny this appeal and uphold the ZHE's decision to approve the wall. The first appeal issue is the 20% rule, which requires that at least 20% of the properties within 330 feet of the subject property must also have a front yard wall or fence over three feet in height. The parties agree that there are 11 lots that fall within that measurement, and of those 11 lots, there are two that have front yard walls taller than three feet. The ZAG calculated the number of lots needed to satisfy the 20% rule by taking those 11 lots and multiplying by 20%, which comes out to 2.2, which he then rounded to the nearest whole number, resulting in two lots being required to satisfy the 20% rule. The Opponent Neighborhood Association, however, argues that two lots constitute only 18% of 11 because two divided by 11 equals 18. Um, the full text of the IDO for the 20% rule states that at least 20% of properties within that 330 feet distance must have front wa yard walls over three feet. The ZHE used a different calculation, but if we're looking at that two out of 11 calculation, that equals 18.8, .8, which is not at least 20%. Uh, the LUHO nevertheless found that the ZHE's calculation and findings overall were rational, reasonable, and consistent with the ZHE's routine practices, but neither the ZHE nor the LUHO addressed that at least language in the rule and whether that is satisfied by the ZHE's chosen calculation method. Uh, the LUHO did note that the ZHE has the authority to use his reasonable discretion in deciding the method he uses to calculate the 20% rule and found that this method that he used here is consistent with his usual practice with other wall permit applications. Um, in terms of statutory interpretation, when there's an ambiguity in the law and the ZHE has consistently interpreted that law in a particular way, then uh, that administrative gloss becomes uh, the law. The LUHO found the ZHE did not err in applying the 20% rule and that the appellants have not shown the ZHE's calculation was arbitrary or capricious. And there was also testimony from the planning department that this is the ZHE's regular method of calculating the rule in wall permit applications. The second appeal issue is the window rule, which states that walls cannot block the view of any portion of any window on the front of the property. ZHE found that the applicant presented evidence showing the wall does not block windows, and the LUHO found this was sufficient. The parties submitted competing evidence regarding the windows, but the LUHO found that videos submitted by the applicant more fairly and accurately depict the views of the windows. As to both appeal issues, the 20% rule and the window rule, the LUHO recommends upholding the ZHE's decisions. Uh, the LUHO found the 20% Rule calculation was rational, rational, reasonable, and consistent with how the ZHE routinely calculates the rule. And likewise, the ZHE's findings for the window rule were supported by substantial evidence in the record. The LUHO concluded that the appellants have not met their burden of demonstrating that a mistake occurred that would justify uh, reversing the ZHE's decision. Um, and this is an accept or reject proceeding, so the council's options tonight are to accept the LUHO's recommendation and findings, or accept the recommendation and adopt different findings, or reject the LUHO recommendation, in which case this matter would be scheduled for a full hearing uh, before the council at our next city council meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. The question that I had is, um, you said it's 2.2 lots. What if you added the third lot? What does the percentage come up to? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez, I think it comes out to something like 27%. Okay, so we go from 18 to 27%, just adding one more lot. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. I, this is a matter that, um, you know, the, the council just reaffirmed the, the wall rule in our recent IDO updates. There was an amendment to remove it or adopt or change it several different ways, and the council ultimately rejected those and sort of sort of reaffirmed this, this rule. My initial inclination um, was to remand this back and have the, the hearing officers deal with that question of less than or up to whatever the, the qualifying language that they sort of skirted 
But I feel like no matter what we do, if we were to send it back, it'll just be back here again. Um, and this is something I think we need to address. We see more and more of these wall rule questions coming up as folks are doing it. And, um, and so I think it's important that the council make a statement on, on these and sort of what we attend when we read that IDO from the council. So I make a motion that we reject uh, the LUHO recommendations, which would schedule this for a full hearing so the council can weigh in on exactly how we think the wall rule should be interpreted, hopefully for the final time. I'll, I'll provide the second for that motion. Any other discussion, Council? Uh, I, I'll just explain. I, I, I do agree with this. I mean, I was one of the ones that was kind of standing for the, the, the original uh, language in, in the old zoning code that came, that was carried over into the, uh, for the most part, was carried over into the IDO. But um, yeah, we're going to keep hearing these. And I think we're going to keep discussing them, discussing them until we figure it out. Thanks. So we do have a motion and a second. I don't see any other hands raised for discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Motion and a second. That was uh, to accept. Accept. Uh, excuse me. Reject, which will send it to us for a full hearing. Well. All right. Correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ms. Hinojos. Councilor Bassan. No. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. No. Councilor Grout. No. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. No. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez? No. Councilor Benton? Yes. That fails on a 4-5 vote. All right, so that uh, we're back on the original. Uh, is someone else want to offer? Mr. President, this is Councilor Basson. Councilor Sorry. Basson. Thank you. Mr. President, I would like to make a motion to accept the LUHO and findings. Second. There's a motion and a second to accept the LUHO's findings. Any further discussion? Uh, Councilor Sanchez. My only discussion is it looks like the LUHO has been trying to be consistent and reasonable in this case. So that's what I'm seeing. I mean, all my whole job, my whole life was always consistent and reasonable and dealt with reasonableness. So I think it's important that uh, that even if they do come up again, I mean, the reasonableness of this is 18% versus 27% on just the on just the wall or one other house. So I think he's really close to the 20%. So as long as he uses this formula and uses that formula every single time and is consistent with it, I think it's reasonable. So that's my take on it. And uh, Ms. Colodin, on that point, uh, I believe Councillor Sanchez is correct that that the uh, that the uh, ZHG has been consistent with the way he's been he's been uh, making the calculations and interpreting the IDO. Mr. President, that's correct. There was testimony provided by Planning Department staff at the LUHO hearing uh, that said that the ZHG is doing this calculation in this way consistently and doing some sort of rounding operation um, when he's doing that calculation and there's a fractional output. Um, I believe that would include rounding up if that um, decimal was five or more, um, but you're correct. Okay, thank you. Councilors, any other discussion? If not, uh, we'll move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. No. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. No. That passes on a 6-3 vote. All right. Thank you. Um, and just, just to wrap up the, the brief discussion that we've had tonight, um, yeah, I think if we feel that, that something's 
out of kilter here. We ought to take it up with the next uh, update, and I'd be happy to discuss that with anyone who would like to. Uh, um, so there we have it. All right. We will now move on to our approvals. And the first one, and the only one, is OC 20, appointment of Ms. Angela Luce to the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. And I will move a confirmation. There's a motion and a second for confirmation. Counselors, any discussion? Anyone signed up to speak? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Let's move to the um, public. We have one uh, in-house, one on Zoom, and Ms. Angela Luce on Zoom, should you have any questions. Very good. Our first speaker is Greg Kaufman. Mr. Hoffman here? Apparently not. On Zoom, we have Aguiola Mezco. That's cool. Are you available? And we will move on to Angela Luce, should you have any questions. Is she present? She is. She's on Zoom, sir. Okay. Uh, Ms. Luce, would you like to, to say anything to us? We appreciate your willingness to serve. Thank you, Mr. President and Council. I'm just eager to be welcomed and onboarded um, after the interview process and, and speaking with everyone. So thank you guys for your time this evening. Thank you. Councilors, any questions or discussion? If not, thanks again, and we will go to a vote on the confirmation of, uh, of Ms. Luce. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we'll go to final actions. Item A, R72. This is uh, uh, my legislation. This is directing that the city not approve a site plan for low density residential development at 3525 Fourth Street in Albuquerque, known as the Brown property, that is inconsistent with what was proposed in the request for proposals pro process. Is there a second? A second from Councillor Davis. Uh, we do have, uh, I've got a couple of amendments. Um, I'm going to move the first one. And uh, if we're in agreement on that, uh, we'll have a discussion about deferral, possible deferral of this for just, just until our next meeting. Um, we have had a lot of back and forth between the neighborhood and the, uh, and the developer. Um, and uh, Ms. Schultz is here to answer any questions with regard to that, uh, or if you would like uh, uh, her perspective on, on how it's gone. But uh, if you may recall from the last time, there were concerns about uh, the design on the property, I think those have been, uh, the design of the, of the standard uh, house that's going to be designed or, or, and, the, um, and some, uh, some changes to the design uh, standards, it, they're called guidelines, but essentially at this point they're becoming standards for the, for the development. Um, and I think there's agreement on that between the developer and the neighborhood, as I understand it, but uh, we've still got couple of outstanding questions. So uh, if there are any questions, uh, Ms. Schultz can, can weigh in or if that's the will of the council. Okay. So seeing none, um, uh, yeah, on, on, the, on the amendment, why don't we go ahead and, and, and uh, I'm going to move that amendment um, and uh, if there's a second for amendment number one, and that's in your iPads. And Ms. Schultz can describe it. 
Mr. President, counselors, I'd be happy to describe amendment number one, which was a result of the discussions that occurred here two weeks ago related to that design guidelines document, uh, what those design guidelines called for, and some of the operations surrounding the future of the site. Um, the major thing that Amendment 1 does is it pros proposes to swap out Exhibit B with an updated Exhibit B, which is an updated set of design guidelines as proposed by Yes Housing. Um, I met with Yes Housing and members of the community on Friday morning to discuss this attachment, and at that time everyone was in agreement about what this amendment proposed and what that new Exhibit B proposes as well. Thank you. There are no questions. We'll go ahead to a Mr. vote. Mr. On. President, I think I apologize for the record. I think the clerk's just clarifying that we had a second for that, and I think I offered it. So. Yeah. And so, and I know we have people signed up to speak, but I think this uh, this particular amendment is not controversial. So, uh, we'll move to a vote on Amendment Number One. Mr. President, uh, I just want to make some clarification here. Um, so when, when we, well, number one is in the packet and then the hard copy that you have here is number two, which will, be okay, got it. Okay. So I just, I just wanted to be sure about the discussions and if people have come to a mutual agreement on everything or is that what we mean? Is that where you're working the deferral through? Yes. So that we could make sure yeah. that, cause I, I mean, if this is ready to go and it's shovel ready, you know, how long has it been sitting? And mm -hmm. it's affordable housing, which is something that we need. So I want to make sure that that um, that everything is has all been worked out and uh, the parties agree and that uh, things are, are moving forward in a positive way and hopefully for a win-win on, on every side. We do have some folks from the neighborhood signed up to speak. I don't know if we've got anyone from the developer here. But I, as Ms. Schultz said, uh, her sense coming away from that, and I kept at arm's length from that discussion myself, but uh, her, her idea uh, coming away from that was that, that there was an agreement reached on, on this First Amendment. Mr. President and Councilor Sanchez, yes, I'll clarify that that agreement is on this First Amendment that is proposed to be voted on right now. There is a second amendment that you received a hard copy of um, this afternoon, and there is not currently agreement about that one. Uh, but the one on the floor right now, there is agreement between the developer, um, the community, as I met with them on Friday, um, and Councilor Benton's office, from my understanding. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the clarification. And Mr. President, before we vote on any of the amendments, can I just ask some questions? Because, you know, from the last meeting to this meeting, it seems as though when um, the agreement was made, how how often do we get involved as a council once the original agreement had been made? Mr. President, Councilor Pena, I can speak to my um, experience here as council staff and in the, the seven years that I've, I've worked here, this is the first time that I've seen the council um, kind of rethink about a development agreement as it was proposed or um, the designs associated with an approved RFP, um, anecdotal to my particular experience. And so by us as a council getting involved after, I mean, you know, I guess some of the conversations we were having earlier about the housing stock and how um, quickly we need to get housing up and going, you know, by us really, you know, the developer originally had a set of plans that uh, and commitments that were going to go by, and then now as a council we're getting involved in, in kind of changing, changing the game a little bit. So, you know, I just, is there anything legally, I mean, could the developer come back then and, you know, be concerned? that this happened and that they're having these either added costs or, or these added agreements that they hadn't agreed to originally when they applied and, and signed the initial agreement? Mr. President, Councilor Pena, um, for the portion of the project that's up for discussion this evening, there is not an approved site plan at this time. There is an approved platting action, but not a site plan, which is what the design guidelines most directly relate to. So. Um, the amendment and the exhibit discuss an approval that has not yet occurred. Okay, and then a, a question. I, seems like there's some question about um, the affordability of um, afford, affordable housing um, component in terms of how many are part of this project. Do you know how many are actually part of the project? I'm hearing three. 
Sure, um, Mr. President, Councillor Pena. So the development agreement that this body approved in December of last year called for um, four units to be affordable to households at at or below 80% of the AMI of AMI, and three units to be affordable to households at or below 65% of the mm -hmm. AMI. Um, that's in the development agreement that this body approved, and my understanding is there's interest in deleting those affordability requirements from the development agreement, which is the intention of floor amendment number two, which we are not quite at yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we do have uh, our friends from Family and Community Services here, to, if there are questions for them. But why don't we hear from the uh, public comment first, and we can hear their perspective, and then we'll hear from the department if they wish to comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, up first is Greg Kaufman, followed by Tad Nemiski. Mr. Nemiski. Thank you. My name is Tad Nemiski. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, yes. What's the interest, my question is, what's the interest to have Isaac Benton and Debbie O'Malley in these five or ten acres, which is given to, to developer for million and one hundred? If, well, city only giving three and a half million, uh, city giving three and, instead other de developer in Isaac Benton, we were getting, getting uh, 100, uh, excuse me, 10,000 every year plus property. Well, here is, they minimize it. Well, why Isaac Benton and Debbie O'Malley have interest in this property? Very simple, knowing what Isaac Benton profession. He looked he want to make sure and they will normally go to right developer or their own developer and play some games. Well, are they all getting the city council, getting kickback? No. No. The answer is no. But who's behind that? And what he's getting and how he's getting? That is interesting. Well, we will see. Thank you. Up next, we have two Zoom panelists, um, Agiola Besco, followed by Marit Tully. Agiola Besco has not accepted my promotion to panelist, so we'll move forward with Marit Tully. Hi there, uh, this is Marit Tully, and um, I won't be speaking tonight. I'm deferring to Dick Nordhaus and uh, Joe Sabatini. I think Dick was gonna talk and then Joe. Thank you very much. Mr. President, I could not find those two panelists. He is not in our attendee list. That is correct. Here's Joe. Joe just came. Mr. Mr. Joe Sabatini, please. Mr. Sabatini's on? Okay, good. Mr. President and Council, I had intended to speak to the main um, motion rather than to the amendments. Mr. Sabatini, you, you could speak to both of them if you like, and we'll give you a little extra time for that. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, we've been working on the uh, design uh, guidelines and standards with uh, Yes Housing, uh, over the past year or so, and uh, the amendment in front of you does reflect the most recent uh, uh, standards that we've, we've all worked on. 
So I'm Joe Sabatini. I live at 3514 6th Street. I am secretary of the Near North Valley Neighborhood Association and a member of the association's ad hoc committee working on the redevelopment of the Brown property. And I live immediately south of the west parcel of, of Calle Cuarta that you are considering tonight. Our association and our community have been advocating for a beneficial use of this property in the hope that it would be a model for the kind of innovative redevelopment that 4th Street really needs. As I understand it, the legislation makes design standards mandatory for sing the single family housing portion of the Calle Cuarta redevelopment projects and requires those design standards to be consistent with the proposal that yes, housing submitted uh, to the city as part of the RFP process. This is a good thing. It keeps faith with the community's decade long efforts on this project. The legislation does a couple of other things. It protects public access in perpetuity to the pedestrian bicycle path through the development. This will integrate the project with the existing neighborhood. It will allow neighbors like me to walk back and forth to the retail businesses in the East Parcel without having to go around to 4th Street. People living in these new homes and apartments will have easy access to Garfield Park and Garfield STEM Middle School. It also provides for maintenance in perpetuity of the community space, space within the project. We want to thank Councillor Benton and Shauna Schultz for their long time efforts to ensure that this is a quality development. We also want to thank Commissioner Debbie O'Malley for her continued advocacy and the county's support on this project. Uh, we ask that you please pass this legislation. Thank you. Thank Mr. You, President, uh, I believe we have Richard Norhouse. I, he's not displaying his last name, but Norhouse. Yeah. Richard Norhouse. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I will follow up on Joe, and I think uh, he expressed our, our concerns very well. Um, Basically, I'm, a, I'm also a neighbor. I'm also a member of the ad hoc committee for the North, Near North Valley Neighborhood Association. And we, as, as Joe said, we do strongly support this legislation and urge passage. We also strongly support this whole project and have throughout. Um, as, as I think uh, you know, we've been through a very long um, community process on this. I've been personally been working on this for about five years. And uh, the result of that process was a report that was integral to the RFP. And uh, we've continued to work throughout the development process to ensure that the community concerns and goals would be considered. Um, the multifamily affordable uh, Eastern parcel is, has been the focus of development and, and seems to be well on its way. The low density, residential west parcel has essentially been put on hold except for the common infrastructure so yes housing could focus on the multifamily. Uh, while the brown project was clearly intended through the rfp and the entire process to be developed as one project the low density west parcel has been platted as a separate development which we understand will not be subject to further public review or comment we also understand that the low density West parcel is unlikely to be developed by yet yet by yes housing. Uh, they are they have talked to us that they intend to engage with another developer as a partner in that in that process. Our concern is that the West parcel is is embedded in the neighborhood, and uh, the surrounding and the. Um, and is of great concern to the adjacent residents. And throughout this process, uh, that has been a concern that a, a, a special attention be paid so that the 
those units are compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and it's, it's very important to us that the community continue to have a voice in this development. Uh, the design of that project has not yet commenced. And the, the issue is that there will be probably no further public review or comment. We feel that the design standards, which are a, a direct outgrowth of the continuing uh, community involvement, they were developed by uh, Decker, Parrish, Sabatini, and Yes Housing, and we, we uh, were intimately involved and collaborated with them. And we met with, with Shauna on Friday, and everybody agreed on that the, the design guidelines were acceptable, and those are the ones that are now submitted to Exhibit B. So we feel that um, it's very this this legislation is very important because it gives the community a voice going forward to continue to push to make this project successful and and that a project that will enhance the neighborhood as well as as provide um, housing. Um, so I thank you very much for your consideration and again urge you to pass the legislation. Although I, I understand that that is um, is not that you're you're just talking about the the exhi the exhibit uh, the amendment and so um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nordhaus. And and as as was stated, you know we uh, <clears throat> we do have there has been uh, concern expressed about the teeth. You know, what are the teeth that will ensure uh, that the design standards are followed? Where does that occur? And um, that was the idea of this additional am amendment that we've just circulated to the, to the counselors. But I'm not going to move that. I'm pledging to not move that second amendment tonight. But I would like to get this first amendment passed, and then we would do a deferral until our next meeting and hopefully finalize the... Uh, legislation so uh, I think that's my close on amendment number one I urge your support Councilor Bassan yes Councilor Davis yes Councilor Feeblecorn yes Councilor Grout yes Councilor Jones yes Councilor Lewis yes Councilor Pena Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Uh, and as stated, uh, you know, we're, we're staying in communication with the developer, and I think we're very close at this point. We're hoping we, we were hoping we could get this passed tonight. We've got this one little piece left, so uh, we'll, Ms. Schultz will be coordinating those discussions between the neighborhood and the developer. And again, I prefer to stay at arm's length of this, aside from just advocating for, for a successful project. So I'll move a deferral until November 7th. Thank you. Second, Councillor Feeblecorn. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grapp. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, Councillors. We'll move on next to. Oh. To nothing. To. We get to go home now? Hallelujah. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good evening. This meeting is adjourned.